Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through. right here, a special edition, a day late, a dollar short, cash in hand, money in the bank, whatever we're talking about here today, we have Jim Cornette's review of money in the bank. I'm already smiling because I heard him laugh, and that usually is enough to break me up. But before we get there, I'm the great Brian Lass. We're also going to have your questions, which I will read to this man, the star of the drive through Mr. Jim Cornette. Yeah, don't put this blame on me today, pal. Oh, buddy, oh, friend, oh, pal of mine. Don't put this blame on a Jim Cornette's drive through Here's the star of the show, Jim Cornette. Putting all the attention on Jim Cornette. We got to talk about it. money in the bank. If you have money in that bank, I'd run, not walk, but run down to make a withdrawal. I don't think that bank's going to be in business very long. But who knows these days? Um, this is your program. This is your dog. I'm just holding its head. Oh, it's a big head this week. Yeah, big head. I, I, you know, you're the one, Brian Last. You're the one, the great Brian Last, who keeps saying, well, Jim, the, the, the listeners want to hear what you've got to say about this. They want to hear your comments on this. All the people that listen to the podcast, all the people that listen on YouTube, they, they're asking me, they're asking on Twitter, they're asking on social media, they're, they're sending in the emails, they're doing the skywriting, they're sending carrier pigeons. They're asking you for your comments on these big events, these big shows. you got to watch this. It's your civic duty. It's your professional duty. Duty. That word will come up a lot. It's your professional responsibility, Jim, you keep saying, to, to watch these shows and bring them to the listeners. Bring your comments, your opinions, your thoughts, your critiques, your tweaks. Somebody was tweaking that put that show together. Maybe if And I watched this show. Yeah, if, if there, the thing that was galling me through the entire experience of it was that that had to pass through multiple people there was more than one person that said we should do all these things it was taped like a month ago wasn't it i i I wasn't there thankfully i don't know exactly when it was taped i wish they had burned the tape i wish it they'd taped it in hamburg put it in the trunk of Kevin Dunn's father's old beat up jalopy and had him drive it back to car catch on fire and him not be able to put it out. But now that you have forced me to watch this program that we're going to talk about here on today's program, as well as answering the fans questions and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody was on Twitter going, ah, I can't wait to hear what Jim has to say about this. I can't wait to hear what Cornette's going to say. Oh, he's going to tell this is going to be one for the ages. I don't know, Brian. What to say for the first time in my life? I do not know what to say about something, and especially, I don't know if I have the 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 verbiage, if I have the linguistic capability, if I have the vocabulary, if I have the not only that but also just the time, the patience. I don't know if I can do justice to what people think I'm going to say about this thing because I just don't know what to say. Was it? Was it all just a bad dream? Did they really broadcast that? Did it go through multiple people who said, yeah, we should do all these things? Who scored the fucking music? The music that they played, not just when they did the cameos, and they're do, 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 do. there's Doink hiding behind a chair for no apparent fucking reason. Or Bruce taking a shit. I can believe that. I can, because I used to call him Mr. Happy Bowels because he was <laughs> because he was constantly going to some kind of a doctor to get looked at and irrigated and flushed out and whatever you do to the nether regions of your colonic capabilities to make sure that everything was it was like you know I had the crawl space in my house done it was done once in 60 years he has his ass done like every 6 months on the inside, not the outside. So I used to call it Mr. <laughs> happy Bowels. Say, your bowels happy now? So I can believe he was in there taking a shit because shit runs through him like X lacks through a widow woman. 
but ju- I just don't, my God, are they all on drugs? Is it just that, okay, they've said, here's our chance. You know what? This is a coup. This is like one of those Latin American countries. They've had a coup. All those fucking little corn kernel nutted fucking walking through the men's locker room, whistling stranger in paradise, fucking never goddamn been in a confrontation or an athletic contest in their life. Bunch of comedy writers have finally, we can finally take this whole thing over from the wrestlers and the wrestling people. Cause now it's a pandemic. Everybody's in chaos. It's a publicly traded company. There's stock people at issue here. The world is in turmoil. We can't have fans in the arenas. We can finally take this over. And we'll just script a fucking wrestling fight. We don't even need a ring. Well, they had one at the finish. They barely used. And then when Vince sees that we're the real geniuses all along and not these wrestlers, then they can just go ahead and start computer generating the wrestlers or maybe just hire some miscellaneous stuntmen from Hollywood because you don't really need the wrestlers and the stars since we don't present anyone as stars since we put preliminary wrestlers in with our main event talent and then make it all so hokey that you can't tell which one's which we don't need any more of these high paid wrestlers we'll just have you know what here's what we'll do Vince this is what the writers are saying in their big writers room we'll go down to some fucking goofy fucking bar or some motorcycle gang on the side of the road in Bridgeport you can find one about every 300 yards and we'll just get a bunch of big guys to just hit each other with a bunch of shit when we tell them to and you don't have to pay them nothing because we'll get them drunk first and you can eliminate all these wrestlers And then the writer, and then the next, then they'll start getting on-screen credits. These little pieces of shit. Then, we won't have to be doing these shows, Brian, because there won't be any more wrestling. There'll just be professional wrestling with fucking actors playing the wrestlers so the writers can make all the money. Can you tell I wasn't a fan of the show? I can tell. I have a hunch. It's just a noodling suspicion that you have down deep in your heart. But, you know, as a matter of fact, my one overriding thought while listening to this program was not, boy, I need to shave my balls. We're going to talk about that later. It was if if only all of the WWE stockholders would get together and file another class action suit against the WWE for impersonating a wrestling promotion, but this time they could hire a man that would fight to the end for their rights and could get the job done and could bring the perpetrators of this malfeasance and malcompetence and maladjusted, malnourished malady of wrestling. If only someone, someone like you know who I'm talking about, the man of the hour, the tower of power, the man too sweet to be sour could take that case and bring those perpetrators to justice. You know who I'm talking about, Brian Last. Call Stephen P. show or two still yes ladies and gentlemen that's the only time that you will hear the word malnourished and stephen p new talked about in the same paragraph because he eats well because he makes a lot of money and he makes money for you you'll eat well if you hire stephen p new to be your attorney you will gain um, immediately 100 pounds because you're going to be eating filet mignon every night And as Nick Goulas used to say, you're going to be farting through silk, boy, when I get finished with you, because Stephen P. New can make you some money. Whether it be a case against a large major corporation or one of these other greedy, avaricious, billion-dollar conglomerates that seeks to perpetrate misdeeds and injustices on the little guy, 
if you've been harmed, your family, your close circle of friends, or anybody in your, well, now social distanced social circle that has some need of a man who will fight for your rights in a court of law to the very end and get you compensated for the harm of the grievous nature that has been perpetrated against you, that man is Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He is the slayer of the dragons, the washer of the outlaw mud show wrestlers, and an all-around good guy who realized that he was getting in way over his head when he decided to send out free T-shirts to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. And he don't do that anymore, but he will more than compensate for that if he takes your case. And remember, he can't take every case in every corner of the world. There was that one case in Zanzibar that was that was tempting him, but he wasn't licensed in Zanzibar. Uh, but he's on your side, folks. He's a member of the cult of Cornette. He's a good guy. And he will help you if help is available in your hour of need. Or he will refer you to the place that you should go. Sometimes that place is very warm and has a lot of fire and brimstone. That's where he told me to go on several occasions. But he'll tell you where to go in a, in a, in a positive manner. Stephen's a friend of ours, is he not, Brian? He certainly is. He's a friend of all of us, as well as Zanzibar. As well as Zanzibar. Oh, good heavens. <clears throat> All right, before we go into the um, the uh, review, so to speak, uh, uh, Cornette's Collectibles, quick update. We've been we've been slaving away, folks, around here at Castle Cornette. We were, were quarantined anyway. Um, between Friday and today, which is Monday as we're recording this, between the two days, almost 400 packages have gone winging their way to the Cornette's Collectibles customers. If you have ordered and sent me money to jimcornette.com since about April the 10th, there is now a 66 and one third percent chance that you have gotten your stuff or it's already in the mail because we have we have knocked that much down. And this coming week, uh, many more hundred packages are scheduled to be in the mail one slight update to our schedule. We are not going to reopen the store. Uh, the store is closed as of May the 1st, as we've told you, so that we can catch up on this backlog. We're not going to reopen the store on Friday, this Friday the 15th. It's going to be Monday the 18th, which gives me three more big days to fight through this backlog. But every domestic order will be out by Monday the 18th. You have my word on it. As far as the internationals, and there are quite a few, because of the uh, exceptional length of time that those take at the window with having to manually enter everything because of our goofy customs laws and et cetera, uh, those are going to be packaged, but they take literally, and this is with Bree doing it, and Bree, by the way, processed 170 packages today in 75 minutes, which I think is just amazing. She's a machine. Uh, but these things take about three to four minutes apiece at the window. That's not really, doesn't sound bad, except when you have 90 of them, it gets time consuming. So during the week of May 18th through the 22nd, we're going to do double shifts. I'm going in the morning with the new orders when we've reopened the website, and Stacy is going to be doing an afternoon shift with uh, internationals a few at a time, so that by the end of that week, everybody's going to be caught up. The store will be open. We're going to be stocked up again. Everything's going to be lovely. Don't feel the need to rush and just welcome us back. You can wander on in at a comfortable speed, and uh, we'll be glad to take care of you then. So that'll be next week. All right. I'm glad you approved. What about this week? I got a lot of shit going on. <laughs> hey, let me, let me explain something <laughs> to you here, first of all. <laughs> no, here, let me tell you something, pal. Pal. I got a lot of shit going on. I don't need it. If I need any shit from you, I'll squeeze your head. Listen to what the people are saying about you. I've got an email here uh -oh. from Nick. And after his, his last name, he in parentheses put how to, how to pronounce it in one, two, three, four, five syllables. So Nick, thank you for writing. He says, try pronouncing it. I promise I will not laugh. Fuck you, Nick. But dear Jim, I am stunned. Your co-host, who is allegedly called Brain, that's right, the great Brain Last, responds to your, your introduction each week with aloha. 
and yet, and I say again, and yet, could not come up with a better theme song in response to your challenge when I said Mission Impossible was the best instrumental TV theme song of all time, and you did not immediately, brain, respond with Hawaii Five O. Yeah, I heard this from a lot of people, too, and let the brain educate you people for a moment here. At first, Jim just said theme song. He said nothing meant instrumental. And I went with different strokes. But you have somebody and I stand thing. by that. And I stand by Here's different strokes. Here's the thing. When you've, when you've got every TV show in history, WKRP in Cincinnati, what you immediately went to different strokes of that nobody in the world would say was the greatest of anything on television. This is very reminiscent of when Pat Patterson started yelling at Bret Hart on one of those Legends of Wrestling panels. When Brett said the Mongolian Stomper, or the Stomper, Archie Gouldy, was one of the greatest Canadian wrestlers of all time, Pat lost his mind. He couldn't understand how some things happen differently somewhere else. Different strokes is perfectly acceptable. You're ripping it for no good reason. Now, instrumental became part of this after the fact. But then I said, oh, well, I'm right. Well, I'm right. I still said it. I said it. I'm talking to instrumentals, and you did not say Hawaii Five-0, The Ventures. I did da, 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 da. And and of course the somebody said the Wild Wild West and it's up there and it's catchy and you can't get it out of your head. But it's not Mission Impossible. And it's it and honestly Hawaii 50 now that I think about it is the closest thing that I can think of to come to Mission Impossible but different strokes whether there's words or no <laughs> words you fucking hey, the Jeffersons I take different strokes over the Jeffersons. What? I like the song. I think it's a good song. It's a good intro. Even if you want to just, you can listen to it as a song, or you well, can, oh, you you can, can evaluate it, it as a song. You or, can evaluate also, it based on the clips that are going on behind it. it. You see Arnold and Willis. They see the new place. They're moving. They're excited. They're playing basketball. This white guy comes and gets them. It's amazing. Well, then you've just described the goddamn Fresh Prince of Bel Air. See, I'm not a big fan of that song. Well, I well, I, and you shouldn't be because it sucked also. But I'm just saying it's the same goddamn. At least you had Wheezy and George moving on up to the big time, to the deluxe apartment in the sky. And Bentley, what about Bentley? Fuck, different strokes. Again, that, that was before you added the qualification of instrumental. Okay, well, even in which not, case I'll go. Not. In which case I'll go with Barney Miller. Oh, and man. Sanford and Son, you forgot last time. Sanford and Son's good. Quincy Jones. I didn't, oh, I didn't forget it. It's just not better than Mission Impossible. Where do you put Gilligan's Island on your list? Above different fucking strokes. Yeah, I knew you would. I put everything above different fucking strokes. And like, strokes it's a, a good it's a, song. It's a song you can listen to, and also it, it removes <laughs> stains. What Alan the fuck Thick. else can you do with a Alan song? Alan Thicke wrote it. Alan Thicke. Alan, well, 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 there, oh, that's like being the nicest guy in prison, isn't it? Here. <laughs> He's Canadian What a royalty. fucking compliment. Alan Thicke wrote it. Barry Horowitz was telling a, said, telling a story one time in the fucking locker room at a raw taping somewhere one time. Me and Candido, I remember, and some other people listened to him, and he, he hushes us over, and he calls us over. He said, you know, I knew a guy that lived, we were in Florida. I knew a guy that lived down here in Tampa or wherever it was, and I went to his house one time, and you'll never guess, if you went out in his backyard and you climbed up in this tree, you could see the roof of the house that Ted Bundy lived in. Wow. That's exactly what we said. <laughs> the wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So a, a song above different strokes doesn't impress me much. Well, name your favorite songs after 1976 theme songs for television shows. Can't pick anything before 76. God, were there any? Didn't they just immediately start going into it about then and all hope was lost? <laughs> well, what's happening? The best, well, what's happening is all right. Yeah. You don't like Cheers? The Green Hornet. That was before 76. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah you, you qualified that. Yeah, Cheers is all right, too. You want to go where everybody I don't like happy songs. Imagine that. Well, there weren't many dour like, TV, TV songs back then. I like forceful, fucking majestic type of musicianship. 
Three's Company. That really gets you jazzed up. What are you going for all the sitcoms to the adventure series? <laughs> Mannix. Mannix. Hey, I was watching that the other day. That's on a, that's on a night on BTV when I'm going to sleep and I don't turn the TV. Yeah. Mannix comes on. Yeah. Da-da, 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 da-da. All right. Anyway, um, what are we going to do first? Should we get right into this? Is what you're saying and get it over with? I think we should probably go to questions after you get this. Because how are we going to do questions and then, all right, let's yeah. cut these off. It's time for, uh, it'll basically be like that pay-per-view event. It's time for new rules, everybody. The comedy portion of the program. All right. This is the Money in the Bank pay-per-view that was just aired recently. That's why you may have smelled an odor outside your residences because this was in the air. And I know that we're in uh, trying times and you can't have a crowd. And so it's, but of all people, once again, all elite wrestling has shown how to have a wrestling event, a television program in an empty building. Where was QT Marshall's gym and 10 fucking preliminary guys stuck around the ring when you needed it? This, this, it, they are emphasizing, first of all, the part that was in the arena, the first part, they're emphasizing the emptiness of the arena by having everything so fucking lit up and so goddamn dressed and produced and overproduced and set up and, and just the light. I mean, it's not that bright when there's people in a building, is it? Are, are there TV shoots lit up that brightly when there are actually fans in the seats? I think so. It's just that you have more lights on the fans and the seats, so you don't really appreciate how bright everything else is. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so I, like I said, I understand it's trying times, but you need somebody out there. It's so sterile. And even like in the, the UFC, the, the uh, uh, Ultimate Fighter series, when they had the gym fights, they had the fucking other fighters as a as an audience, and we've talked with All Elite, they put Pineapple Pete and whoever else are the wrestling school students out there, whatever the fuck. It's some fucking atmosphere. And instead of lighting everything up, bring it fucking down and give the guys in the ring at least some attention. The one thing about this is you can hear blows better. You can hear bumps better. You can hear the air go out of guys. You hear guys breathing hard when they go that long. That's good. It sounds like there's exertion to this. So if you just had some encouragement from the outside, and I'm not talking about your main event guys or any, they have got a hundred wrestlers under contract that nobody's ever seen on television and they can't have, and I guarantee God damn to you, they had more than 10 or 25 or 50 or whatever the limit is supposed to be of people in that building. Um, in both places, at the tower and in the other place, they could, they can do something. Anyway, they couldn't do anything with the first match. However, a four-way match sucks to begin with. There's never a good one, and and it never makes any sense. And without fans, it's worse. They had a four-way match for a, a, one of the tag team championships that they promote in this company am i correct i believe so okay so a four-way match with i how did they talk the new day into their fucking entrance it looks like people vomiting after they've fucking eaten too many skittles and just the <laughs> fucking just and here comes a lucha house party and everybody's a gimmick and everything's a gimmick so there are no gimmicks and here comes Morrison and his little tag along brother and the forgotten sons. And already I've forgotten their names. And I zoned out automatically because in this ring, you have seven underneath talents and John Morrison in my estimation. I, 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 what the fuck? A bunch of guys doing things to each other. And I say this when there's fans in the stands and I, but <clears throat> could we not have had a tag team match between two of these teams where it would have made sense and you could have at least followed it if they if they tried hard enough? I could have watched Miz and Morrison, because I like John enough to watch Miz against any three of or any of these other three teams, and it probably would have been pretty good. 
it still wouldn't have been fucking main event level because does anybody take the Lucha House Party seriously in those outfits and that you never hear them speak? We watched this show for a while. I don't know if they, you know, I don't know what the fuck their deal is. The New Day, um, I don't know where. I like uh, Consequences Creed. What's his name? Xavier Woods. Yeah. Worked with him in TNA. He was a good kid then. Um, haven't seen a lot of him lately. Don't know where he is. Thought he was in this thing. But I know Kofi Kingston is a good athlete. But uh, putting him in this with all the hoo-ha music and the whole nine yard, it just it looked like a bunch of underneath talent. And John Morrison, who at least visually still somehow looks like a star. He just has that charisma. It's not, it wasn't the talent's fault that this didn't make any sense because it wouldn't have made sense if there were people in the stands anyway because it's a four-way and there's no way to make it make sense. But they still, there were backslap tags everywhere. So I'm just going to stop even referring to that because at this point, it's obvious the guys in the ring don't care and nobody's going to make them care. The agents, every single one of the agents knows it's not a tag and it's just lazy and it's a shortcut to do something because you're concentrating on a fucking move. John Morrison knows it's not a fucking tag because he went to OVW. And I would give guys one chance to do a tag like that. If I told them don't ever do it again, they ever did it again, they'd never see TV again. That's why they'd never do it more than once. Um, If they're not going to tell these guys, do do it right. It's like, you know... a basketball player and a basketball coach in the NCAA uh, tournament fucking guy shoots from out of bounds and is wondering why that it, people are saying it don't fucking count. And the coach doesn't know either. So he can't tell him what the fuck anyway, back slap tags. Who gives a fuck at this point? Cause nobody cares. I don't know in this match who the heels and who the baby faces were to be quite honest with you, because they all do the same kind of shit. You can also, you can pin someone else and under the rules of this match and win the championship, even if you didn't pin the champion, which is completely fucking ridiculous. And I've hated that since the start. The atmosphere was horrible. At one point, Kofi Kingston went to kick fucking Miz off. Miz was, had it, had his leg had tripped him and was going to go like spin into a figure four. (laughs) Kofi went to fucking put the boot on Miz's ass and kick him off, and his boot went straight past his ass, missed his ass, and Miz ran and dove over the top rope. Um, It was sloppy. I couldn't follow any of it because it didn't make sense because they all just did a bunch of shit to each other, and they all, by the time it was over, they looked like a bunch of fucking drunks wandering around. Um, Big E, at one point, did something, and I, maybe he's going to dive or whatever, but he just turned around and ran backwards to the ropes, And the fucking corner guy for the Forgotten Sons was going to pull the rope down, but he either it was too tight because he pulled it, but it didn't go anywhere. But Big E just dove over the fucking top rope, took his own bump. And they just kept doing shit over and over. And then finally, Big E hits the least impressive big move of the match. They have hit each other with every kind of kick and strike and jump off the top and dove out, fucking flipped around hopped around jumped around picked a bale of cotton the whole nine yards throughout this whole match and Big E hits a power slam of some side slam of some description from about three feet off the ground and that got the win what the fuck it and and they were taking chances of getting hurt to accomplish absolutely nothing and you couldn't you can't not only you can't follow the fucking who is mad at each other, but you can hardly, once they all get in doing this shit and nobody bothers to tag back and forth, you can't tell who's on whose team. And, well, except if the, the brightly colored tights. If, they're, if they synchronize with somebody else's brightly colored tights, I guess they're on the same team. I don't know. This was a fucking mess. Yeah, you know, it hit me watching this that nothing was registering with me. It's like I'm immune to this kind of match now. If you had shown me this match 25 years ago, I would have lost my mind. And now I'm just immune to it. Yeah. And that's why they didn't have those kind of matches 25 years ago. Because if you did them more than once a fucking year, the same thing would happen. People get immune to them. They're doing a lot of fucking moves. It doesn't make sense. And it's not set up to make sense in the fucking booking. I used to love the old four corners 
tag team elimination matches that we had down south. And I, I stole it and used it in Smoky Mountain. There was a team in each of the four corners. And a tag could be made to any man, right? Not just your partner, but anybody else. If you're in trouble and you can get to a tag, blah, blah, blah. And you would have to accept the tag. If you didn't accept the tag, it was an automatic disqualification. You were out. And as each, uh, as a member of each team was pinned, he was eliminated. And finally, the last team in the match would be the winners. And you could set up some cool things with that, with people being able to tag somebody else instead of just their own partner, just that one little weird spot in the rules you could do some fun spots with, but still you knew who everybody was. If you had the free birds in one corner, the midnight express in the other corner, the rock and roll express in the other corner and the dirty white boys, Lynn Denton and Tony Anthony in the other corner, which is a match that we actually had one time in Houston. Everybody knew who the teams were. They all fit each other. And there was a reason why all those teams were in conflict with each other because it was the, the, the match was for a cash prize, right? So even the heels, the free birds and the dirty white boys, no honor among thieves. Well, and actually in the midnight express, cause it was a three heel team, uh, of four team elimination, <clears throat> which was better on the rock and roll because it made them the only baby faces. And by the way, guess who won the fucking rock and roll express. I saw one of those in Lenore um, for Smoky mountain. It was one of the most memorable matches of that trip. I loved it. It was, the Heavenly Bodies versus the Headbangers versus Al Snow and Unabom versus the Thugs, Tracy Smothers and the Dirty White Boy. That's right. And you you do the spots. You don't just fucking just make it scrambled eggs through the whole match. You start out and you let the baby face shine with a heel. And the fucking heel gets frustrated. And then finally... The goddamn uh, fucking heels get upset and they fucking tag out to the other baby face, right? So now you've got the fucking, uh, uh, well, I, I've done this backwards now. The First of all, the baby faces, to fuck with the heels, let's say Riggy Morton's in there with Tom Pritchard and Tom Pritchard's partner, Jimmy Del Rey's on the outside, Robert Gibson's on the outside, and the other two teams. Fucking... Riggy Morton to goddamn fucking uh, make the goddamn uh, heels embarrassed or pissed off. He tags Jimmy Del Rey. So now Jimmy Del Rey and Tom Pritchard got to get, get in against each other. Well, they have to fucking wrestle. So they lock up and they immediately go in a crisscross. And they run to one corner finally and try to tag both of the Rock and Roll Express, but they drop off. So then they run to the other corner and try to tag another team, but they drop off. They run to the other corner and try to tag another team. They drop off. The fans are going crazy. You understand what the fuck's going on. These guys don't want to wrestle each other. And then they finally get out and blah, blah, blah. And then you get some heat. And then you start eliminating people. And you can go 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, because you've got four teams to work with. But you still... The heels get heat on the baby faces. The baby faces make comebacks. It's not just incessant. <clears throat> one team foiling or one guy foiling another guy's shit and throwing another guy to the ring so the other guy can jump in with no tag or whatever the fuck. And sometimes they do tag and sometimes they don't. It just, nothing registers because nothing's made important because nothing makes logical sense to your eyes. It's just action like a video game which is where a lot of these guys probably getting their moves these days anyway uh, um have i mentioned how bad i hate lacey evans's gimmick you've made some mentions i don't know if you've gone full cornet or anything well it, it's not worth full cornet it's just what the fuck the southern bell she does a promo i wrote abysmal and phony She's doing her makeup while she she has the to be a Southern Belle. She has the lightest hint of a Southern Indiana accent in in the way she says a couple of things. I don't know where she's from, but it ain't fucking Greenwood, Mississippi. And, and, and but she means nothing. 
she's given stuff written, obviously, to say, which is the first mistake, and then it sounds phony when she says it. And then here's Drew McIntyre with one of their girl interviewers in the back, who the first time I saw the girl interviewer, I thought she was going to take the whole fucking thing. I think this was it where she just really just started out and did the whole thing for him. But it, Drew McIntyre is well-spoken. He looks good. He sounds good. He had nothing to say here. And besides the fact, he kept calling Seth Rollins a performer. He's the great, one of the greatest performers in the <sighs> And it's just little things that the producer should be saying. No, don't say performer. Say competitor. Say, if you can't say wrestler, say competitor. Say athlete. Say something. Don't say performer. But anyway, he needs something to say. He said nothing important here. I would have to think that if he'd have said whatever he wanted to say on a goddamn worldwide pay-per-view, that it would have been better than this, which means they're giving him shit to say and telling him to say it. And they need to cut that out, apparently. Either that or if this was the best he could fucking do on his own, then they don't need to put a microphone in front of him because he's well-spoken, sounds good and looks good, and said nothing to get himself or anybody else over. And nobody seems fired up. Have you noticed that? We'll get to that later on. Somebody was whispering by the time we got to their promo, but nobody is excited about this shit. Nobody comes in, and, and uh, uh, Troy Graham would walk in there with a goddamn microphone, take the whole goddamn thing over. But anyway, this was bland. Then, what, what did you think of Drew McIntyre's promo, or do you remember it? I don't remember much of it, but... All right. Based on what I've been seeing on their shows and other things with him, I don't think you're off. Uh, well, I'm I'm off all right, but uh, our truth versus MVP. I now discovered if you skip the entrances, it saves a lot of time on this. And I was then I was excited because Samoa Joe was on color, even though I didn't have a lot of hopes for this match. But then our truth starts cutting a promo and was, I thought he was trying to tell MVP. He was going to teach him how to fuck because he kept saying he's going to teach him how to ball or balling. And then he started shooting an imaginary basketball <laughs> where I then realized he was talking about basketball and not fucking. And then I, what was this? He was dribbling and shooting an imaginary basketball, talking about balling, balling. And I don't, what the fuck was that? What was that about? We see, R Truth is a purely comical wrestler at this point in time. Well, and, he, and he does a lot of skits where he, I guess, misunderstands things and gets things wrong and is a comedic foil for upper card and mid card performers. You made a mistake there. You said a, a, a what'd you say? A comedic wrestler. I will purely comedic. I'll go for, but wrestler, I won't go for, I know he can, I've seen him do it, but if this is what he's doing, no. So as I was about to fast forward this, Bobby Lashley entered and took MVP spot. And apparently now the guys can just make their own matches. There's a, and now they're like, oh, Cornet wants a general manager because he's a general manager. No, I don't care if it's a general manager, a fucking commissioner, a fucking promoter, a goddamn security guard with a fucking set of handcuffs. I don't care. There needs to be someone in authority in a professional sports franchise who fucking okays changing of fights or matches or games or whatever. The guys can't just walk out and say, I'll handle this and I'll be MVP. Okay. And. Uh, what the fuck? At least he beat the shit out of our truth and beat him one, two, three, which was the proper result. But any impact that they wanted it to make by redeeming Bobby Lashley for the stupid shit that they've had him in just that I've seen lately by having him just go out and beat the snot out of somebody and beat him was negated by the stupid and nonsensical and illogical and just flat out blase way that they did it, which was to just fucking let him out there. So I, and apparently they obviously have no 
uh, use for our truth anymore because that was pr- a pretty flat fucking one tackle pancake match. He makes them laugh backstage. He'll be around for a while. So he's Disco Inferno in TNA, is what you're saying? If you want to use that example, you are free to. <clears throat> it's he just the the people got tickled when the Steiners would take him out and pull his pants down and duct tape his wrists and ankles together. Anyway, then we had a promo from the Possum King, the Grand Marshal Marshal of the Pixley Possum Day Parade, Baron Corbin did a promo that was <laughs> scripted <laughs> and I, I just wrote various scripted noise. He was just talking like this and nobody uses contractions anymore. And that's the first thing I used to tell guys in promo class use contractions. You know what? Do you know what I'm saying now that you think about that? What do you mean? When, Someone says something that they have obviously rehearsed and they are saying it like this, like, I am going to beat you. I am going to stop you. I am going to. No, you say, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to stop you. Nobody sits there and speaks perfectly in this cadence when they're really emotional or mad or even just mean what they say, they use contractions. They don't say, I am going to be the WWE. I'm going to be the WWE champion. It sounds more natural. These guys are not using contractions. They are memorizing this shit, and then they are enunciating it for the camera. Emoting. You know, the more I think about it, Olivier was a, a perfect fit for this company because he could go and emote and be an artist. And the fucking jack-legged fucking comedy writers and fucking various civilian personnel, non-wrestling people that are orchestrating this shit these days would just piss their pants over it. Anyway, then Bailey and Sasha did a promo, and they're trying to instigate or tease some... Uh, dissension between the two best friends there i like bailey and she actually even she carries some of these fucking promos off um and just some of these things off this is the first time i've ever seen tamina work because bailey wrestled if i could use that term tamina in this match have you seen tamina before oh yeah she's been around for a long time Woo boy has she ever showed up at wrestling school? Well, she's a second generation. She's a legacy. Okay, she's Jimmy Snuka's daughter, right? Correct. I suspect the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you say I that? Suspect... Why, do you... <laughs> why do you say that? This is the first Samoan I've ever seen that couldn't work. I've... <laughs> Is she, is she first of all, she looks uncomfortable as fuck. She's working in a full body outfit and a leather overcoat. What the fuck? And it, you know, but I Kurt Henning couldn't get a match out of fucking Tamina if this is what Tamina did. At, Bailey worked her ass off here. She really did. She tried, and you can hear at least you can hear the girls trash talking, except sometimes when you can hear the guys trash talking, it sounds phony too, because they don't know how to trash talk. Um but the girls when you're they're screeching or whatever, but I it, it, Bailey goes up and fucking starts pie facing this big fucking girl, and she's just no facials, no body language no uh, aggressive stance i know she's supposed to sit there and get pie faced a little and then bow back up there was no bow up with this girl no facials no aggression on offense she kicks with her left foot that has to be boy first time you get in the ring with her that'll be interesting when you don't know what's coming from that side and get it well i was gonna say get it in the balls but that may not happen in this instance it's the female division but it, the stuff that she did on offense, Tamina, had no life. Bailey's bumping her ass off for it. And then Bailey, it's a big girl, little girl match, right? And Bailey took the power stuff, but then she goes to work her leg, wraps it around the post, works the leg, but it was the most stationary heat I've ever seen. Tamina, does she never, 
rolled over and started crawling to get pulled back. She never got to the ropes to pull herself up to get her leg cut out from under again. She just stayed in one place, which may have been the safest thing for Bailey. From what I saw later on, at, at that first she Tamina made her first little false comeback, which was kind of bleh, to be honest. And just and she's just walking around. And then Bailey caught a fucking super kick. That super kick, by the way, she does a super kick only if the girl is bending over. Did you notice that? Her super kick's about fucking thigh high to but anyway, Bailey catches the super kick and she got kind of an ankle lock. It wasn't a real ankle lock, but they didn't have the a camera angle where you could really tell bad, but it looked like it's the only ankle lock she could get on because Tamina's so big. And then she, Tamina sells her leg well on the ground. She's screaming. Now you can see the face all of a sudden. But whenever it comes to actually getting up, moving around, or doing something, so so Bailey worked spots based on Tamina being immobile. And then Tamina made another comeback on the floor. And I was like, fuck, I have worked with radio DJs that are more natural workers and have more oomph and personality when they're on the offense. And Bailey takes a great bump over the announce desk. And boom, and she was just trying to keep moving and be a ping pong ball for this girl. But there was no sense of, I call it oomph, but you know what I'm saying. On offense, when somebody had oomph, but you know, imagine if that had been Awesome Kong in her day in that fucking spot or whatever. But anyway... Then the, the, the fucking Tamina throws her back in the ring and she gets up on a top rope just barely and is going to jump off the top rope, but Bailey's going to put the feet up and Tamina's going to catch him, but she barely come off the top rope. Bailey put her feet up and Tamina caught him and almost fell over sideways. And then somehow rolled Bailey up and hit her with what looked like at the same time the most awkward and painful Samoan drop in history didn't even as another thing when you take somebody up over your shoulder like that I always used to tell guys because it's important to me this is the way I always thought should be done when you take them up in the fucking shoulder ride right imagine you've got somebody up in position for the Samoan drop their bottom arm their right arm or left arm, whichever, whichever one's toward the mat, you need to trap that by your side when you fall backwards. Because if you fall backwards with them not on your shoulders good and n that arm not trapped, they're going to go straight down sideways instead of flat of their back, and it's fucking awkward. You can blow your shoulder out. or, or and, and it just, anyway. She hits that Samoan drop, then chases Sasha around at kind of half speed. And then while she was rolled back in the ring and while she was distracted, Bailey rolled her up. One, two, three, thank fucking God I wrote. And the roll up was not the smoothest thing I've ever seen or fucking not the roll up. She went for the Samoan and drop again and she crucifixed her or whatever the fuck, but good God, I was glad that was over. And then so the baby face to get something back goes to give Bailey the Samoan drop again. And Sasha comes in and clips her fucking leg. And so she just lays there, uh, clips Tamina's leg and she lays there immobile again, not even looking up at the people that are standing over her taunting her. It just was fucking rotten. You know, you haven't seen much Tamina which I think is interesting here in this situation because I have seen a bit of her, like I said, and I came out of this match and said, that's the best Tamina match I've ever seen. Are you fucking shitting? I'm not saying it was good, but I'm saying that was the best I've ever seen her in a match. I'm taking a drink of bottled Sprite over that one. <laughs> All I, I, I wrote at this point, I, I said, I really like Bailey, but Kurt Henning couldn't get a match out of Tamina. And then I wrote an underline twice, is it over yet? The show, I mean. No, it's not. To the answer to your question. <clears throat> All right. Next, Seth Rollins. I love Tyler Black. I love the man that has become Seth Rollins as a worker and as a person. This promo 
once again, it was not only scripted, but there was no oomph. He has no bass in his voice. He's not showing any personality. It wasn't a wrestling promo. It sounded like a, a, somebody giving a statement at a town hall meeting about the zoning changes. Nobody is excited. Nobody's mad. Nobody's over the top. Nobody's fucking grabbing your attention. They're just speaking and reciting the lines that they are given to tell the story that has been written for them. He couldn't, nobody calls anybody names. Was Seth a heel? I don't know. He's not fucking calling Drew McIntyre's mother a whore. He's not, he's, he's, he wants to, I don't understand the whole Monday Night Messiah thing. I think that's a recipe to be boring. That's something a writer thought up, it sounds like. I, to me, Seth Rollins ought to be goddamn, look at me. I'm a goddamn pussy magnet. I'm the greatest wrestler on earth. I'm fucking, I'm 6'4 and 2 fucking 30 or whatever, and I cover the ground I walk on. Or just something, put yourself over. The heels don't brag, they don't lie, and they don't cuss and fucking call anybody any names. And the baby faces don't sound genuine so that I'd actually like them as a fucking person, even if I know their business is bullshit, because they keep reminding me every segment. Well, you know, at this point, I put on Twitter, I didn't have as a visceral a reaction as you did, but I did post that Seth Rollins went to the Brandy Rhodes School of Acting. Because <laughs> that's the thing. It's people, they're very talented at reading lines. They're very talented at reading their scripts. But what, but what is this? You know, this is not what I want to watch. Drew McIntyre, I'm better than you on your best day. And I only have to be half as good as you to be. I'm just, just, just something, just some fucking oop, just fucking cut a promo on somebody. Don't sit there and just, oh, anyway. And then I wrote, does the office staff get drug tested? Oh, that's because here was Bray Wyatt's entrance coming up next. Oh, I forgot you watched this match. Oh, boy. You know, I, <laughs> I actually caught a few minutes of SmackDown on Friday. So I saw the go-home angle between Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman building into this match where the puppets showed up. And I said, oh, my God, if only Jim saw this. They will not do anything like this at the show, I don't think. And then, of course, yeah. that's exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, they can't have fucking 10 people in the fucking audience making noise and cheering and booing and et cetera, but they can have three people with their hands up a fucking sock puppet's ass out there doing funny cartoon voices. I, I've heard so many people rave about Bray Wyatt. And I said, you know, and, and a couple of times when we've done the experiment of watching the, the shows, he's either was on the other brand or, he was out with an injury or whatever, and then finally we saw the I saw the the fiend business, and that was pretty fucking rotten because then they caved the fiend's head in with a fucking sledgehammer and he kicked out at two or something, in that one fucking I couldn't really tell with all the red light going on. Remember we watched that fucking thing. Oh, yeah. What all did they do to the fiend Bray Wyatt? I don't even remember, but it, it was, it was, it was, well, it was blunt instrument after blunt instrument, caving heads in with sledgehammers. He was kicking out a two, blah, blah, blah. Then I saw the fucking firefly Funhouse match and I never want to see him or John Cena again. I love John Cena to death, but I figured that was John Cena's farewell to the WWE is why he did that. I never want to see him in a wrestling ring again after that. I'd, you know, be more than happy to talk to him, you know, if if we ever got in public again. But now here comes Bray Wyatt smiling and waving with kids show music. Hey, he looked like Mighty Igor with the <laughs> with the fucking beard. And the only thing it was the only thing was missing was he does. He didn't have a stuffed animal or a fucking pull pull dog on a fucking leash. Oh my god, that is funny. If it's, it's a mighty Igor, and it, so he comes out. This is for the universal title. He comes out smiling and waving with kid show music. Here comes Braun Strowman out there earning his money, not like people who are wanting to be you know given things for nothing. <clears throat> okay. 
why is Bray Wyatt selling anything? They caved his head in on pay-per-view with a fucking sledgehammer, and he kicked out at two. So why is he selling shit? Then, it's it wasn't really these guys' fault either. This is not a match that works in an empty arena, because this was a grudge match between two guys that are primarily workers and not at all wrestlers. It, it, I think Strowman probably can't wrestle his way out of a fucking paper bag to begin with, but it's his gimmick to be a big fucking monster, and it's not Bray Wyatt's gimmick to be Jack Briscoe. So Strowman, whether Wyatt can wrestle or not, he probably can. Strowman can't, and Wyatt shouldn't, because it's not their, their gimmick. But then they're having one of these fucking matches, you know, with the heavy fucking shots and everything in front of no people. It doesn't work as well as if you're working an athletic contest. So they tried, but a match like this doesn't work with no people to begin with. The match that they were having. And, you know, Braun missed a charge and went over the fucking desk, and Bray Wyatt is now getting heat on the baby face, and a pig puppet starts cheering for him. Now fans are, no, nothing was going to help this. Right? Now I'm, I'm, now I'm not going to make any more excuses for him. I, I gave you the reasons why they were handicapped and why they were trying hard, but then suddenly a pig puppet appeared. So now instantly I hate this anyway. Um... Then whatever they fucking did, they did. And like I said, then Bray Wyatt takes a choke slam off Brown's Braun Strowman and it, you hear the impact and boy, you hear the fucking air because those choke slams are not fucking easy. And you hear him sell it. Oh, <clears throat> and it would have been perfect if this wasn't the guy that got hit with a fucking sledgehammer and kicked out at two or whatever the fuck all the fiend did when they were trying to kill him and couldn't. Why did you establish that he's invulnerable and now he's got it now? You know, that's the reason why you should sell shit, no matter how big you are. Because when you have to sell shit, you can't. Because nobody's buying it. Then suddenly, Bray Wyatt was in the ring, Braun Strowman's on the floor. And then Strowman pops up from behind the apron wearing a horror mask. This mask has something to do with the Wyatt family in the past, correct? When first came up to the main roster and he was associated with the Wyatt family, that was his mask, I believe. Okay, well then, it doesn't make any sense that, well, I, I, like this made sense to begin with. Braun Strowman comes in with the horror mask and Bray Wyatt starts laughing and like he recognizes him. So it wasn't somebody else's mask that he used to know. It was his own mask. I don't know why I'm even bothering to try here. They stop the whole goddamn fight, the whole fucking match. They stand there and look at each other. Braun Strowman kneels down in front of Bray Wyatt, the guy that's just been trying to kill him and pull his eyeballs out. Well, no, he wasn't. He should have been, but he wasn't. How did he know this mask thing was going to work and get this reaction? Why did this mask get this reaction? Because it's still obviously the fucking guy that was just beating the shit out of you, Bray. Then they hug. And not only do they hug, but the puppets are happy. Brian, do you know that's the first time that I've utter ever uttered on a podcast or in any wrestling critique or review in anywhere, any company I've ever been any school I've ever trained in, any seminar I've ever been involved in, I've never used those words in the English language in that order before. The puppets were happy. <laughs> and then Braun Strowman takes the mask off, stomps on it, picks Bray Wyatt up like a sack of shit, power slams him and pins him with one power slam. The guy they ran over with a goddamn bread truck on pay-per-view got pinned with one power slam. What the fuck? This is worse than AEW. Because they should have had the match with the hands in their pockets. Why not? Because this was so fucking phony and bullshit and stupid and goofy and could obviously not happen. And nobody meant anything. 
and they have proven themselves to be phonies and whores, whores for a paycheck to do this type of shit in public. So it's worse than AEW because I can forgive those guys who have worked in fucking barns all their careers, well, except for the guys like Jericho, but you know what I'm saying, the, the VPs, who worked in barns all their careers and they have a wishy-washy fucking money mark with balls the size of goddamn kernels of corn that won't tell them, no, you're not going to ass off and do goofy shit on my national television program. So stuff like this I could see on that program. But this is worse. Because either Vince think this, thinks this is a good thing or somebody has convinced him. I rest my case. <sighs> Should have wrestled a match with their hands in their pockets. <laughs> I mean, what? Of course this is worse than AEW. That was my big problem with AEW. I want an alternative to this, not a watered-down version of this. And when I say this, I don't mean Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman. I mean the whole presentation, the whole, you know, this is, this is welcome to this wrestling event. Now we're going to have skits and comedy. And nothing what is serious, and, and just cameos by puppets and toilet dwellers. I mean, just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> toilet dwellers. It's fucking, it's, a, it's Saturday Night Live. <sighs> then. It's more like SCTV. And I say that because Saturday Night Live was a skit show. SCTV had skits, and the whole idea was you actually get to see the guts of the TV station behind the skits. So you go from watching the television presentation of some movie with Bobby Bittman to seeing <laughs> Guy Caviero in the yeah, office Guy like, Caviero. oh, what is this? Get LaRue in here. You're like, you get to see that. This is SCTV. I mean, done really poorly. Yeah. But it's more that than Saturday Night Live. Very good analogy. Good simile. Good comparison there. <sighs> but... Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, um, they did a package for Seth and Drew. Once again, I wrote, why is Seth Rollins talking in, in a monotone, being so soft-spoken and deliberate? And from the package, from the action that they showed, it doesn't look like the heel got very much heat on the babyface to call for this being a big fucking grudge match. That's exactly right, Harley. That's exactly what I think. Harley's up here visiting for this program. Um basically it showed fucking McIntyre manhandling Seth Rollins, Seth Stooge coming in and take, getting a cheap shot and getting laid out and Seth being run off with the baby face standing in the ring going, I'll, I'll fucking kick your ass. It is. It's, it's, yeah. Then they did, the, oh, by the way, the big fight introductions for the title matches with no people. What the fuck? It, it, I, I swear to God, they could have at least asked the cameraman to cheer when they introduced the fucking world champion, Drew McIntyre. If the if they're gonna do big fight introductions, have somebody there to fucking make some noise or something. But but anyway, didn't we just have a match for the world championship? At WrestleMania, um, Mac no, we just had a match like the previous fucking match. Oh, I thought you meant the previous one for this title. Yes, the Braun Strowman versus Bray Wyatt match was for what for, for the Universal title. So that title is more important than the world title because the world is not as big as the universe. So why does the world title match go on after the Universal title match? I know one reason because they the fucking Universal title match couldn't have followed this fucking match. But back-to-back -back champion world singles, basically championship matches. And here, how come the matches for a shot at the title, Z, S in parentheses, titles, plural, are more important than the title matches themselves? The Money in the Bank ladder match for the title is going on after a match for the actual championship that the ladder match is going for a shot at see what i'm saying mm-hmm yeah okay i'm not gonna fucking eat these guys up because this was the only thing on this program that was 
actually valuable in any way for anybody. A except it was devalued that Drew McIntyre is, is the, the, the world champion during this 15-minute segment. There's another one for the last 15 minutes, but Drew now is the world champion. You can't have two fucking champions. It's fucking stupid. Can you imagine if they'd have gone to Hulk Hogan in 1987 and said, Hey, Hulk, we're going to have another, uh, another fucking champion that we're going to push on, on all the shows. Anyway, these two look like athletes, and they look like stars, and they can work. And they started out especially, at least... Maybe not by the finish, but they started out working this like a contest. They kept it moving, but there was nothing too outlandish. They were wrestling. You could hear the fucking grips, the lockups. The first two minutes of this was better than all of, well, that's faint praise again. I was going to say all of Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman, but, you know, faint praise. But there were no puppets and no mental breakdowns in this match. And then I wish they'd used the ring a little bit more. Just, I wish somebody would use the ring, but Seth got Drew selling on the floor and kept him down for a while, hit a couple of big dives. They did three big knees that Drew sold big. And then finally, on the third big dive, I figured, I didn't know they'd put the knees in the middle, but it was that was a good breakup thing where they didn't just do three dives in a row. But obviously, third time is the, the backfire. On the third big dive, Drew <laughs> fucking... I don't, I don't know why they did it like that, but I don't know whether he was going to catch him and just throw him in one motion, but he caught him on the dive and kind of set him down and then belly to belly him over it. But he belly to belly him overhead over the announce desk, which was a nice fucking bump. But it seemed to me like it'd be safer on all parties involved, just kind of catch him and take him with it. And, you know, but nevertheless, I wasn't there, but that was a nice bump. Um, then it, it Drew made a comeback, and they did some nice back-and-forth stuff, but here's where the WWE came out again and spoiled this thing for me a little bit. Seth gets the chair from ringside, goes over and runs the bell ringer out of his chair. The bell ringer can't even make any noise. can he be on somebody's side? And he runs him out of the chair, and he takes the chair, and he comes in, and he almost gets in, and the referee's telling him don't do it, and he thinks about it, and he looks, and he milks it way too fucking long. That's where these, they always, that's WWF style. They go into too much milking and too much dramatic. So the announcers can say, he's conflicted mentally. Should he use the chair? Well, yeah, he's a fucking heel. Why shouldn't he pull a goddamn power drill out of his tights if he could and fucking drill the guy's a hole in his brain? Fuck. And, and nobody's going to fuck it. If you're going to go grab the chair... And bring the chair in. You're either going to use it or you're just, you're going to fucking not. You're not going to fucking sit there and think about it in the middle of a fight for 30 fucking seconds, especially while your opponent lays there and does nothing. But then he decides not to use it, throws it away, and Drew takes over. And then Rollins got a superplex on him, but then he gave him the superplex and it looked beautiful. And then he immediately rolls over, picks him up and gives him another move. So the guy can't even sell the superplex. It was like the superplex was the setup for whatever the Falcon arrow or whatever they called this fucking thing. And then McIntyre comes back with a DDT. It was starting to drag at this point. They were trying to tell the story of a war of attrition, but there's no people there. I was at this point, I was wishing they'd get to the point because they hadn't stunk the bed. Too bad, except for the fucking conflicted chair use. And then McIntyre German suplex Seth off the top rope all the way across the fucking ring and charges him, and Seth meets him with a super kick. He's just been German suplexed off the top rope all the way across the fucking ring. He hops up and meets the guy with a fucking super kick and then hits him with his fucking curb stomp and gets a two count. Then they do back and forth kicks and blows. After he's hit the curb stomp on the guy, the guy's by up doing back and forth. And then McIntyre hits the Claymore kick one, two, three, which was fine. He should hit his finish once and win. But <laughs> they just put this together like it's a fight scene instead of a match anymore. And I like these guys, and they did a very good job, and it was the only worthwhile thing on the show. But is there any reason why Rollins had to get his a two-count on his finish 
and then the guy get back up and then do some fucking shit back and forth for a second and then go to the finish. Why couldn't he hit the fucking curb stomp and the guy get his feet on the ropes? And then Seth go to the goddamn referee and complain and then fucking McIntyre have time <clears throat> to recover so that when fucking Seth charges back at him, then he could hit a last-ditch Claymore kick out of nowhere, boom, and fucking barely cover him, one, two, three. It would be, it, they just do these things and then pop up and then do some more shit. And so nothing means anything. But anyway, in this environment, this was the best thing on the entire show, and it wasn't even close, and... I forgive them some of their transgressions. I'll, in this case, I critique it because I'd love to see these guys just do a little bit better. Especially with the fucking promos and the verbiage they're being given by these nitwits that should never have been allowed to buy tickets to wrestling matches that write this shit these days. It, you know, I just... So I, I want to be positively critical in their case. What do you think? I thought it was all right. I think it's one of those matches where if there was a crowd there, I would have liked it a lot more. Well, that was deep. It's hard and, to get into wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. wrestling. Wrestling is just like sex. It's better when a crowd is there. I can't get into the empty arena matches. So when I see this match, I'm like, you know what? This is one of the better empty arena matches. But then, like you said, it, it went on a little too long, I think. Well, it, it and then it, it right as soon as I, because I w was thinking, and I mentioned this earlier, but I wrote this, right as the bell, one, two, three, and the winner and everything, whatever happened to the heel trying to cheat and get foiled? That's the, they just beat Seth flat. He should get beat with the fucking world champion's finish, but there was nothing that he was trying to do something devious and he got foiled or whatever. They just hit each other with shit back and forth till the pin the heel never pulled hair didn't gouge eyes didn't do a low blow didn't choke anybody wasn't didn't ignore the referee's repeated request to break the hold whatever the fuck <clears throat> you know use bad grammar in front of his mother whatever you can't tell the difference between the heels and the baby faces and then i wrote as soon as i wrote this they shook hands so is seth rollins now the monday night messiah now switching baby face or is it just that the writers have never watched wrestling before? I think, C, the writers have to answer to Vince, and this is what Vince wants. Vince never had the fucking top heel shake hands with the goddamn top baby face at the end of the fucking world title match on a pay-per-view in, in my time with him, so I, I can't see him suggesting that'd be a good idea now. That You know, it, the Ring of Honor thing, the Code of Honor, I liked that to an extent we had to get around it in certain circumstances, but it was great to differentiate the heels from the baby faces without actually having to call them good guys and bad guys or heels and baby faces. All we had to do is put on the tail of the tape code of honor. Yes or no. Yes. If they followed it, they shake hands. That means they're baby faces. They're sportsmen. No, if they don't follow it, that means they're assholes. <clears throat> and every once in a while, one of the heels, if it fit his fucking personality, would be a yes, because he would follow the code of honor, but he'd do it in a derogatory fashion. Or he, uh, in uh, like an MJF would do it. You can imagine that. And, but to have these guys have this fucking match, and then just shake hands, and it, 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 it but the heel never had any heat to begin with. So he didn't lose any heat, but it doesn't, it does not make sense. Look at the pretty monkey. It's the Chewbacca defense. Our <sighs> truth did another promo. Do you have any earthly clue? What I recognized a few of the words. I've never heard them in that order before. It didn't make any sense. He was babbling about his 24 seven championship. Yeah, that's about what I made out out of it. He mentioned Tom Brady, I think a few times. So I was, not sure because he's the goofy R Truth. Is he confusing Rob Gronkowski with Tom Brady? Or is that, is, I mean, he's still the 24-7 it's, it's, champion. It's Ron. Ron Gronkowski with well, Tom Brady. Is he still the 24-7 champion? Does anybody give a shit? R Truth? No. That's it. Well, and obviously he doesn't either because he just, uh, you know, here's the thing. You got a guy like this 
that if you want a fucking guy to have a crazy gimmick, then he needs a fucking manager because if the guy's going to be crazy, then he, I don't buy that. He's wandering around the streets. If this fucking blithering nincompoop in his promo cannot find his way home at night. So he needs somebody handling him. So if you're going to have a crazy lunatic, give him a fucking manager. All right. We, it, it's time. I think there should be a special place reserved in hell in a way for whoever, whatever the numb nuts was that came up with the idea to have both these fucking stinkers of, of matches at the same time. But then again, it did get it over the fucking twice as quick. So there's that to be thought of, but I said it when we heard the concept and it, it, I, this nothing here changed my mind. This is one of those things where some goofy Hollywood reality show dipshit in a writer's meeting. I've seen footage of their writer's meetings where they all have their little computers out in front of them and their phones. And they've got ties on sitting around a fucking conference table, just all writing on their fucking computers because they're writers and they have ties. And they have never had a goddamn one match between a bunch of them except for Michael Hayes, who they probably have given a lobotomy by now. I think he's the only wrestling person still there on the writing team, isn't he? They, it, 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 he's either he's either gone over to the other side or, or, or you would have heard of Michael Hayes murdering some of these fucking people. But anyway, they said, oh, this will be fucking hilarious. What a concept. They have to fight from the start of Titan, the bottom of Titan Tower, all the way to the top and get the blah, blah, blah. And this is the kind of shit that makes Vince's eyes light up because they can fucking have a set and they can have special effects and a blah, blah, blah. So the, uh, this fucking stinky bullshit consisted of Lacey Evans, Nia Jax, Carmella, Shayna Baszler, Dana Brooke, who her entire face looks like it was remodeled after somebody set fire to it and put it out with an ax. Ooh. What the <laughs> fuck has happened? Did she do that on purpose or was she in a horrible accident? What the fuck? And Asuka or the women's match and AJ and Otis and Alistair black and Ray Mysterio jr. And Daniel Bryan and the Grand Marshal of the Possum Day Parade are the men. So you literally have two of the best wrestlers in the world, three if you count Mysterio, but definitely Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles, involved with a bunch of fucking underneath guys and a bunch of fucking preliminary women, except for Shayna Baszler, who... Boy, I, I get her UFC training taught her well for fighting in the women's room at, at Titan Tower. <sighs> Why did all the girls stand there to catch Asuka on the start of it when she dove off the... They were all standing there looking at her for 10 minutes. And then she jumps and they catch her. I'd just walk away. That's the Miss Piggy bump from the Muppet movie. And, and then she gets in the elevator... And and all the girls go, oh, shit, we got to run up the stairs. No, they don't. There's three elevators. I've been there. There's three elevators side by side. Could have just got the next elevator. But you know what? Since that elevator moves so slowly, and since there's only four fucking floors to this building to begin with, the stairs would have been quicker. Here's a question. Why did everyone get off the elevator and or exit the stairway at every single fucking floor? If you know you're supposed to go to the roof, <laughs> why don't you just go to the fucking roof? That building has a four-story parking garage underneath it and then four floors, four levels of offices, one, two, three, and four, and then the roof. You can go top to bottom in the elevator or on the stairs in under a minute. I did write that this is not worth making notes about at the start, but then I made some because I just, uh, you know, it, it, not any critique of any work in this because they're <laughs> to fuck. They played music underneath the alleged fighting. When, 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 when possum 
you know, one of these days he's got to get fired so he can go to AEW so they can make a tag team of Possum and Pockets. When Possum threw the weight in the gym and broke the mirror, did you hear the dramatic music? And he, and he stood there and looked at it. Oh, oh my God, what have I done? You idiot. You fucking buffoon. The WWE has told you people that you have to do this, that you have to have this fight, that you have to start down in the fucking gym and end up on the roof. They know you're going to break shit. Otis put a barbell on AJ Styles and he acted like he couldn't get out from under it. So he even beats fucking uh, balding buck on that goddamn ho ho hokey injury angle he did a while back so he could go home. Yeah, that was really bad. It was clear that AJ could have rolled that thing right off him at any point. Well, of course. <laughs> and then, as we mentioned before, Rey Mysterio ran into Brother Love in the shitter. Br poor Bruce, if he's going to do that, he needs to fucking dye the hair back because now that he's gray, it just doesn't look right. He, it, 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 he looks... He looks more like fucking uh, uh, Pat Robertson. Uh, the music changes on every cameo. That brother loves music. Then that doinks music. Then Plastic Face is somewhere on the second floor, I believe. And by the way, you couldn't really tell what was what. I know, I know they have painted and carpeted since I've been there, but they were just in various places in the building, but it, they weren't taking a linear path to the roof. They were just fighting in various places in the building. So I don't know what the fuck they were doing, but in some conference room, Plastic Face got a fake briefcase, and then Stephanie appears to tell her, hey, stupid, the real one's on the roof. I don't know who's faker, the guys or the girls. So then AJ Styles is looking for Rey Mysterio, but he sees the Undertaker poster on the wall, and he gets scared enough of the Undertaker poster that he stands there and looks at it for 15 seconds while he's supposed to be in this fucking mad, 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 mad world race to the fucking Big W to find the, the money that Jimmy Durante buried under the fucking palm tree. I feel like Stanley Kramer produced this goddamn pay-per-view. He stares at the fucking Taker poster for 15 seconds and then sees a room with blue light in a coffin, so he has a boneyard flashback. And AJ Styles never used to take drugs. But now the LSD is coming back on him. And then Alistair Black beats him up. And then Paul Heyman's at a buffet. And he's got terrible manners. And suddenly the guys and the girls run in. What do you mean he has terrible manners? Well, he picked something out of one plate and decided he didn't like it and put it back in. <laughs> but then he saw the fucking, and he, they didn't even have like something he'd really go bonkers over, like a big Philly cheesesteak. It was like a fucking catering sandwich. It just looked like a big bread roll. And he really likes that. He's, you know, he's, he's looking at it real nice. And then here come the guys, and the girls both come in from opposite sides. Otis, have I mentioned that I despise Otis and his mumbling and his goofy bullshit and the whole cartoon nature of his fiasco? You have not. Well, I do. But at this point, Otis throws the food on Heyman, which he just stands there with a look on his face and takes... He didn't do anything to to run off or to pitch a fit or to whatever. He just stood there, and then that was. I thought somehow somebody's gonna he's gonna take a bump. If I had been there, and been forced to be involved in that, although that would have been a stretch, I would have at least taken a bump or something. But anyway, he gets food thrown on him. They have a big food fight, and one of the girls gets power bombed through a table while they play marching music in the background. <clears throat> then Otis goes to the cafeteria. I used to, I can't remember the guy's name he used to cook there, but he made great double cheeseburgers. And and he loved me coming in because I was the only one that would get a double cheeseburger with extra cheese. Or I'd say, if, if give me the, the chicken fingers, I want extra ranch. All these other fucking twits that used to eat there were coming in getting fucking sandwiches and salads and granola bars. So he didn't, he didn't ever have any fun cooking for anybody till I showed up. But anyway, he goes in the cafeteria. Being mumbling and goofy, as I mentioned, why is John Laurinaitis in a fucking hover round? 
Why did John Laurinaitis pull up to him in a, in a fucking motorized scooter that looks like he's a fucking 400 pound old woman at Walmart? If that was an inside joke, I didn't get it. I have no idea. Is has he recently had a? Because he took a bump off the the fucking horrible bump off the pie off the scooter, but he took a bump off the scooter, so he can't have just had like leg surgery or something. But anyway, he hit John Laurinaitis' face with a pie. Then Oscar came through. And there was a custodian mop, mopping the floor, and Oscar spazzed out at him. That's what I wrote. There's only four floors in this fucking building. Where are they all going? Daniel Bryan gets hold of somebody, and he's actually trying to make shit look good in the middle of this. I, You know, he's way too dedicated. <laughs> then, oh, it was him and Aleister Black. Uh, I think uh, that we're, was, he was kicking the shit out of or something. But then somehow him and AJ show up in Vince's office, and they play Vince's music. And they bust into the office fighting. I didn't see Beth. I don't know where Beth Zaza was because she doesn't let anybody in Vince's office, whether they're fighting or not. But he's sitting at his computer in the back of the fucking office. They fight for a while, and then he turns around, and then they see him. If somebody burst into my dead quiet office having a big brawl, I'd probably, it wouldn't take me but like, a, I would say 1.2 seconds to turn around and say, what the fuck are you doing? But anyway, we mentioned Vince looks 100, and I just, I was like, wow. He couldn't even say, get out. He just, get out. And did he stand up straight from the desk? I don't know that he stood up straight there. I'm not sure. He looked better there than he did on the Triple H 25th anniversary spectacle. I don't know. But anyway, I just, he, he looks old. And But anyway, so he kicks them out of the office after they straighten his chairs up. They go back outside. They start casually talking about, well, I will, you were scared. No, you were scared. And then they start fighting again. So now the only two talents in this fucking whole fiasco that's worth a shit. And they pretty much just buried them as being stupid, fake, phony. Oh, I wrote this. My next note is capital punishment legal in Connecticut. That was just something I thought I would research to see if we could somehow penalize whoever thought of this shit. So, by the way, Vince's office is 30 feet and one flight of stairs from the roof garden. But the women got there first, even though AJ and, and fucking Daniel Bryan were approximately 40, 44 feet away. So... Nia Jax picks up one of those girls and was pressed her over her head, but lost her and fucking dropped her and then tried to throw her out of the ring. But the girl wasn't ready. She just kind of, it looked like she was tossing a mark out in Tulsa. Um, and I wrote all these people taking all these chances of getting hurt bad for this fucking shit that will be laughed at for years to come and remembered as the worst thing ever in wrestling until next week, probably. Um, I've, pontificated that I don't know whether I hate the music worse or Oscar's incessant screeching. And now, by the way, now that when they got in the ring, having no announcers was a sounded especially stupid. Um, and then I started to fucking fast forward cause I was going to skip the rest of the girl shit, but the possum King showed up. So I thought I'd watch this and he climbs a ladder and the Oscar knocks him off. Asuka beat the Possum King to win the women's Money in the Bank match. She knocked him off the ladder and got the fucking case. So if 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 anybody could be buried any deeper, Possum King right now is looking up at the treasure at the bottom of the money pit. Because a woman just beat him for the woman's Money in the Bank briefcase. Then the announcers come in and celebrate Asuka's win of a, quote, world title opportunity. Because Vince doesn't like the word shot. Although somebody should be shot for this. Uh, then Otis showed up and couldn't figure out how to climb the ladder. I believed this. The first time all night, I believed in anything that Otis or any of the rest of these idiots did was when he couldn't figure out how to climb a ladder. And then it was a nice touch when he tried to broke the steps, except the problem is that everybody knows those goddamn aluminum ladders 
The steps don't break even if you're 350 fucking pounds. So that was phony too. Then I wrote, I hate Otis again, exclamation point, just to make sure that everybody knew. Then the Possum King threw Rey Mysterio and Aleister Black off the roof. We've said somebody was going to take a bump off the roof. I guess they're, are they dead now? I don't know. AJ Styles returned from being buried just recently. Well, but that was in a movie. This, this was a match. This, this, this was, was a, a match for, the, for, the, <laughs> uh, for a WWE title opportunity. So if they get thrown off the roof and die, they, they may really be dead. Is there a window cleaner? Titan Towers. Is there a potential that one of them landed on that? A, a window cave. One of them landed on him, possibly. Yeah, I mean, you know what? <laughs> you know what? They ought to open fucking <laughs> Raw, or they should have opened. They ought to open, open Raw tonight with a fucking last night graphic and a fucking zoom from a, a shot of the street with there's goddamn. Uh, fucking AJ and Daniel Bryan both, or not uh, AJ and Daniel Bryan, but Rey Mysterio and Aleister Black both hanging off a goddamn window washer's fucking scaffolding. When one of them's it's around their neck and the other one their foot's tied in it. Help, get us down. <laughs> See, I, if you're going to do shit, then do shit. Because this stuff was supposed to be funny and it wasn't. And it was supposed to be wrestling and it wasn't. And it was supposed to be entertaining and it wasn't. So at least do something. But anyway. As I mentioned, I felt bad for AJ and Daniel Bryan having to lower themselves to be involved in this. This is the kind of thing in the old days when there was someplace else to go that guys would have heard this and say, yeah, okay, I'm just going to go to the car and get my bag. I'll see you later, and you would never see him again. And then finally, AJ and Possum got the case. But Elias, from nowhere, who wasn't in this match but was hiding <clears throat> apparently in Titan Tower all this time for just such such this opportunity. Jumped in the ring and hit Possum with the guitar. But AJ fumbled the case, and guess who caught it? Why, you don't have to guess because you were there. I saw it. I was waiting. I didn't know if you wanted me to actually jump in, but your favorite wrestler in this match got it. Otis. Otis is the wouldn't you know who won the pony. Otis. My boy Otis won the pony. So now Otis has a world title opportunity at an important WWE championship. Hold on one second. I don't know if I can tear this many pages at the no, same time. No, no, don't rip it. No. Fuck these fucking people. <sighs> This is what's going to, the, the pandemic isn't going to kill, it, 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 the, the thing it's going to kill is wrestling. It ain't going to kill 50 million people around the world. It's just going to finish off wrestling because they've been looking for excuses to do this fucking shit for a long time now. And they got guys that are veterans. Some of them are just with a ridiculous need to be on television or some, some of them just can't handle their money and just have to have a check and just are whores for a paycheck, have no principles and no standards. And you got guys that don't know any better because they've been fucking taught that this kind of shit is okay because they're all entertainers. They're not wrestlers and they're actors and television performers. And you have just enough fucking people that are scared to not be with the times and to be left behind because they don't learn and evolve. Just enough of those small-minded, gutless wimpy in, 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 in individuals to sanction this kind of shit because they're afraid the cool kids won't like them that people think that this is okay now and that this is what wrestling should be or that whatever they're doing over on TNT is what wrestling is supposed to be and there's no problem with this and this is not insulting or offensive or stupid this is what we get this is what we get. And and by the time that there's fans allowed back in the arenas, after they've seen shit like this, we won't really be able to tell. <clears throat> oh, there'll be people there. There'll be people there going to look at stupid people doing stupid shit. There won't be any wrestling fans in the building anymore because there won't be more wrestling. There barely is now anyway. There are a bunch of these fucking goofs that watch Tosh.0 oh, or Jackass or stupid videos 
and think that wrestling is supposed to be a bunch of stupid people doing stupid shit that you're not supposed to take seriously. So the pandemic will do what all these other assholes, the wrestling artists and the doll wrestlers and the dick boys and the fucking invisible men and the fucking Hollywood producers of the WWE and all the rest of them that want to be anything other than what they are supposed to be, which is wrestling and wrestlers. They've started it. The pandemic's going to finish it. And by the time that this whole thing is over, they'll say, well, we can just do all this. It's more fun. And wrestling is done officially. Here, I need something else to fucking tear. Were you, uh, were yeah. you happy that the Elias Baron Corbin feud apparently has continued since WrestleMania? Oh, I don't know what I could have done without a, a fucking knowledge that they're going to continue their epic rivalry to only outshone by Bobo Brazil and the Sheik in terms of longevity and violence and hatred. Elias and Possum. <sighs> All right. That was Money in the Bank. <clears throat> yeah. Now, after Money in the Bank, there was a documentary about The Undertaker. And I I'm well. I'm looking forward. I not on the channel I watched, but I'm going to be watching that on the WWE Network, and we're going to talk about that on the experience because I've heard it's quite good, and I love me some Undertaker. But no, I got the pay per view, so I could watch this on real television. Because as we, as you recall, the only place that I cannot get the WWE Network is in my TV room on my TV because it's supposedly too old, fucking nine years old. God damn, I've had underwear longer than that. But anyway, so I didn't see The Undertaker. I will watch that by, by the experience. But no, as soon as this thing was over with, and not a moment too soon, it said, thank you for getting this pay-per-view event, and I deleted it immediately. You know what I need now, don't you? Brian, I need somebody to talk to. Yeah, it sounds like it. I need some kind of therapy. I need to... I don't know whether I have, it's not PTSD. It's not post-traumatic stress disorder. It's PTMITBD, post-traumatic money in the bank disorder. <laughs> because somebody needs some mental help, either the persons that promoted that or the person that watched it, which would be me, but one of us needs some relief. And as we've mentioned, a friend of the program here on the experience and the drive through the folks at better help. I don't know if they especially specialize in therapy for people who have recently watched horrible insults and assaults on wrestling, but they do have a wide variety of professionals that can, can help you and work with you on most any day to day problems that the average person might have. If you don't have access to counseling in your location or especially now in any location, if you don't want to go out in public and take the chance, you can do this online, by video, on the phone, whatever. And we've had numerous members of the audience write and say that better help has helped them, whatever problem they may be going through at the time. And there's a lot of stress going on in the world in general these days, much less the stress that most people have in their life to begin with. So anyway, better help committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and you're free to change counselors if you need to. You find the person you like. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. The folks at BetterHelp want you to start living a happier life today, and so do we. So if you go to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com slash drive, you can join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional and get 10% off your first month. That's where the slash drive comes in. Because if you if they know you're one of us, you get a deal. Anyway, better head. That is a, a slash drive, is it not? I believe so. I said yes. that to you. I got to check. Yes, betterhelp.com <laughs> slash drive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we like them. We like them. They like us. You'll like them. Like is and love is in the air. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. I think a variety of the roster of the WWE talent that had to be involved in this dog and pony show should get some counseling. Try to forget it as best they can. Do we have questions? 
This week, we have many, many, many questions about wrestling. Well, I ain't got a lot more time now. Well, we got to get a few of these in here. Let's get one out of the way. I right, did get one out of the way. That has been sent many times. This was sent on April 23rd, April 25th, April 28th, again on April 28th, a third time on <laughs> April 28th, May 2nd, and most recently, May 9th. Well, it looks like you're falling down on a job of, try, of asking these questions in a timely fashion, Brian. As I said before, sometimes there are reasons that you may not comprehend when you send in the question as to why your question does not get on the air. There are various reasons from something we recently talked about or something that won't be a very good answer or why are we going to waste time on the show with this question? Who knows? Maybe this falls under that category, but let's uh, find out right now. This was sent in to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com. From Lamingus Maytubby. What? Lamingus Maytubby. I, I question whether that's a real name. Are you ready for Lamingus? I'm, 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 yeah, I'm ready for Lo, Lamingus's fucking Quillamane or whatever. Good evening, Jim. Could you give me your opinion on why Kendall Wyndham and Eric Watts didn't become bigger stars? When I look back at their matches, these guys had a lot of talent. So what went wrong? Oh, good Lord. Um, Kendall was a tremendous worker. He just had no size. He was just so skinny. He had the height of the Wyndham family, but did not have the weight. And I mean, Barry was skinny when he, when he first broke in, he was 18 years old or whatever. And then he, he gained some weight and still when he was 260, he could move like a lightweight, but Kendall was just a couple inches shorter than Barry and couldn't have weighed 200 pounds i mean he was just painfully thin and you know plus when you when your big brother is at one point the best wrestler in the entire fucking world you know you suffer by comparison so i think kendall it was his size and it, i saw him oh god uh it must have been in charlotte but last year at, at at a fan fest, I think it was in Charlotte, and now he's got to go to 260, 270, and he looked fucking good. He did, it wasn't like he was fat, because when you're six four and to be a wrestler, you know. But he he had a shaved head. He didn't have that Q-tip hair, shaved head and a beard, and he was fucking massive. I said, Kendall, Jesus Christ, why weren't you this big when you were working? Um. So with that, with Kendall, I think it was with Eric. I, you know, he was a good athlete. I don't think he wasn't a natural worker. His heart wasn't in it. His dad pushed him before he was ready to accept that push, as almost every promoter does. And I just, I, you know, he just didn't have it. I, I don't think that's, you know, that's not knocking him. I don't think he really wanted to have it that that bad. It just, you know, he just, it didn't, didn't happen. All right, well, we received several questions in the last week. Even though I guess now Dark Side After Dark doesn't air directly after Dark Side of the Ring anymore, but it's it, still it, it on. airs way, way after, way after Dark. It's uh, on a week's delay. They air the show after they air the rerun of the previous week's show, so that it it it's it's sandwiched in between a rerun of the previous week's show and the new broadcast so that somebody will watch it because that's the only that i mean it's smart television programming strategy because it's such a fucking rotten show that nobody would watch it if it sta stood alone or after the program was over with that everybody's interested in which is where it was originally well the questions we've received have wanted your reaction to i guess there was a montage of you and eddie mansfield going back and forth and mansfield cut a little bit of a promo on you well, and that was an app description, a little bit of a promo. I was all ready to get hot so I could fucking cut him. What I said on the show put him in his place. I didn't even need to fucking come up with a response. It was, you know, he's a typical fucking, well, or Cornetter, where you ever had the book ratings went in the toilet? Yeah, that was co coincidentally during the 25 years that you were fucking blacklisted from the business for being a piece of shit. Uh, so you wouldn't know what was going on. It, no, it, it was a little clip, but... He, it, he tried to cut a promo on me and he failed. I mean, at this point I'm abusing children to continue on with him. What I said on the show was, was not only the truth, but it was enough. He was a, has been and a never was, it was frustrated because he never got anywhere and it was thinking about him. 
And I mean, you know, I guess now he would be called a pretty good worker because the standards are so much lower. Guys are much better athletes these days, but they can't work because they have no experience at actually working because they're not allowed to. But uh, so Mansfield may have been okay today, but at, at that point, there was a hundred guys in every territory that could easily do whatever the fuck he was doing. So, you know, it's, he's pathetic. And the thing is this, at least this television show has exposed. I can't tell you how many people on Twitter or have sent emails when I get a chance to read them or whatever it goes. Well, now we know why that you always said Vince Russo was an asshole or you always hated fucking this guy, or you always thought this guy was a prick because all these people now are being televised on this show and everybody's going, yeah, what a fucking blithering asshole, Stossel. People that weren't even born when he made an ass out of himself in the wrestling business are now saying, yeah, what a fucking prick that guy is. So it's it's coming out. Well, another hot button issue we received several questions about. I'll ask you one of them here. I don't know if you've seen this video, Jim, of a comedian making comments about wrestling fans, but let's ask this question. Well, go ahead, and then I'll I'll respond to it, because I've seen the same things being asked. This was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Benjamin P. Hope this email finds you well. Recently, comedian Tom Segura took shots at wrestling and wrestling fans. Segura said on his podcast, quote, I think wrestling is for fucking retards. I think it is the fucking stupidest shit, and I think you're a fucking tool. If you're like, hey, man, it's not fake. It's fucking fake, and you're a fucking idiot. There are no real fights. These are just stunt people. He also compared wrestling to the Special Olympics, saying, <laughs> yeah, uh, quote, yeah, so is the Special Olympics. It's fine to go, but it's not real. It's not a real competition. This prompted a lot of wrestling fans and wrestlers to weigh in with their opinions the likes of King Corbin, Ricochet, and Dolph Ziggler are just a few names. Oh, boy, boy, boy what a fucking uh, lineup to come to the defense of the wrestling industry. Myself, along with others, would like to know what your opinion is on the situation, and what would you say to someone to who is utterly uneducated on professional wrestling and the risks that are involved? Well, first of all, I, I saw people tweeting this, and I was not going to go down this rabbit hole, as they say, because to respond to this guy, first, I'd have had to watch what he said, which would have taken a while, and I haven't had a lot of free time lately, as we all know. And secondly, then I would have had to figure out who the fuck he is, because I've never heard of this guy. I've never heard his fucking name. I watch a lot of television. I've never heard of a comedian called Tom Figura or Segura. Uh, I've never heard anybody talk about him, never heard of his show. I've never heard of anything he's been on. And I figured, you know, it, it was just another ass wipe knocking wrestling, but here's the problem to be quite, I've, you know, to be perfectly honest, if he's watching what I'm watching here over the last fucking six weeks, he's right. Now for him to say that about all professional wrestling of course i've you know i'd have to know who the guy is to hate him and cut a promo on him because then i'd have to fucking research how unfunny he is and how much his shit sucks and how many times he's been you know on fucking failing fucking shows if he had or whatever the fuck but i don't know why first of all people aren't more pissed off at him calling anybody retards because in this day and age what we have done is modify our language from when we were in third grade and called each other retards <laughs> because that's one thing is that's that's some language that ought to be banned for the fucking sake of the goddamn, you know, kids and people who have issues and difficulties. That's not a nice word. Um, But as far as him knocking wrestling, if he was saying that after he just watched Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat or any wrestling pretty much ever that took place in, through the 80s and early 90s, then I could go in with both feet. But if the only wrestling he's seen is what they had on all petite wrestling last week, or that was on this fucking so-called pay-per-view that hopefully nobody paid to view, he's fucking right. There's no pretense of trying to make anybody believe anything. It is stupid. It is silly. And it is fake. 
but it's also not wrestling. So while I want to defend the wrestling business, I'm more insulted by the guy with his hands in his pockets, the guy, the dick spot guy with the invisible man, guys who are supposedly professionals in the business doing things that make the business worse than what this guy is saying about wrestling and wrestling fans. He's just some fucking ass wipe comedian. It's not even on fucking real television. These are actual supposed professionals supposedly in the industry. <clears throat> so it depends on what he's knocking. If he's knocking professional wrestling, fuck this guy and feed him fish heads. But if he is commenting on what he has seen presented as professional wrestling that we've seen over the last weeks and months, I don't blame him. If that's the first time he's fucking seen it and he saw that, if the, if the first time I ever saw professional wrestling was either this money in the bank fucking bullshit or some of the fucking stupid shit that the fucking outlaw mud show contingent of all elite wrestling does, that'd be the last time I ever saw wrestling. We wouldn't be having this conversation because I would have never watched it again because it's stupid. Well, part of his argument, though, is the idea that there are still people who argue that it's not fake and that he's, you know, saying, oh, shut up, it's fake, it's awful. Well, in this day and also with what they have just seen in this day and age, I'm surprised at that also. Now, I, I know several guys that could show you and prove to you that it ain't fucking fake if, if they had you had a hold of you. And yes, you could still, if you did it right, present conflict that certain people, in fact, a decent number of people would believe was legitimate but nobody's trying. So yeah, whatever I, I, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm more disgusted with offended by re repulsed by the people actually in the wrestling business, calling themselves wrestlers and having a match with the invisible man. than I am some fucking idiot comedian mouthing off about shit. He doesn't know anything about. And, and I can't blame him if he if he saw Matt Hardy climb out of the ice machine in a different set of clothes because he had just come from another dimension. Yeah, anybody that does watch that and, and thinks it's fucking in entertaining in any way or makes any sense is a fucking idiot. But I wouldn't use the, the word retard because that's insulting to kids and other people who can't fucking defend themselves or deserve it. Our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Charlie in Starkville, Mississippi. Oh, here we go. I knew it. Well, this, I fucking this concerns knew it. Mississippi, actually, this it question. It concerns, well, by all means, let's put that at the head of the fucking docket if it concerns Mississippi. It's got to be on the fucking front of all of our minds if it concerns Mississippi. As Mississippi goes, so does the country. What are your thoughts on Ted DiBiase putting his $1.6 million lakeside mansion up for sale? And what do you think about the timing, considering his ties to the largest case of embezzlement in Mississippi history? <laughs> God damn, old Charlie going for the jugular. Um, I did not know that Ted had a $1.6 million. And I wait a minute. I now I'm not Ted has lived in Mississippi for years. I mean, he moved to Jackson. I think his wife was from Jackson. As a matter of fact, he moved there back in the eighties, a $1.6 million house in and around Jackson, Mississippi would be bigger than the state of Mississippi itself. Yeah. Honestly, I looked at pictures of that house and I said, if that was up here in New Jersey, that'd be a whole lot more than 1.6 million. Well, I didn't know they had a $1.6 million house in Mississippi. So <laughs> color me shocked to begin with. But I, I tell you what, if I owned a $1.6 million house with the recent publicity, I probably wouldn't have put it up for sale right now because that would call attention to the fact that I owned a $1.6 million house. And Teddy ain't been in the wrestling business for quite a while now. I'm, I hope he was good with his money. But holy free holy. That doesn't look good. I thought, you know, Ted had a nice place, but, you know, for heaven's sake, I mean, maybe he really was the million-dollar man. Maybe it wasn't a gimmick. Or maybe he got part of the $1.6 million from the state of Mississippi. 
I, I like Ted. I don't want to knock Ted. I don't know what was going on. I don't know I've ever met his son. I may have met him in passing once. He's the one primarily implicated in this from what I've read, but I don't know. I don't know there. $1.6 million in Mississippi. I mean, he made a lot of money over his career. It's not a terrible amount for a house. Are you out of your mind? So it was a nice house. I'm sure it was. That's what I'm saying. I don't know anybody that would have to live in a $1.6 million house in Mississippi. That'd be bigger than the fucking governor's mansion in the state of Kentucky, probably. Well, that's where you can get a house like that for $1.6 million. Up here, that'd be like $7 million. Well, yes, but up there is ridiculous. I'm talking about in the real normal world. I don't know that there's, unless you have a family of 27 people, I don't know that there's a reason to live in a $1.6 million home. How fucking much room does anybody need? Good heavens. Well, our next question. I've only got, I've got a little 5,400 <laughs> square foot cottage here. Our next question sent in to... Ain't paying 1.6 million bucks for it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Our next question. You know what your problem is? You've been up there too long. You're like, as a matter of fact, Heyman, when I was renovating the castle years ago when Heyman was coming down to OVW, and I still own part of it, but I was persona non grata on the fucking... Uh, uh, doing actual television. So I'd come in every once in a while just to see what was going on. And I told him, I said, yeah, I'm working on the, you know, the castle. That's when we were originally going to move in. He said, oh, uh, you know, it's been in your family. I said, yeah. I said, you know, we've only got three acres. He said, only three acres. I said, well, yeah. I said, you know, a lot of people on the street have six or seven, but my dad just, you know, he got a small place because he didn't have a ton of money when he bought it. I said, he built most of it himself. He said, and then I told him, how big it was and what we were doing to it and what it was worth. And he said, good, good God, you can get a house like that for that amount here. I said, yes, because it's not fucking New York. The only people that can afford to live in New York are people that are either doing something fucking crooked or elsewise, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, own the world. Our next question. Second. You're not going to defend your homeland. I'll let your statement stand. Well, people evaluate it however they wish. But yeah, I could be a bazillionaire in Mississippi right now. Let's get our next question. On Twitter, using the hashtag corny drive through from Mr. Rucker has enough TP, no hoarding. <laughs> what the hell is up with Alberto Del Rio? The oh, good God. The I latest just saw allegations that. are astonishing. I just saw that. And I'll drop your son off in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> He'll never find. Jesus. I don't know. Like I said, I've met this guy once and he, he was on one of those, uh, one of those shows over in England that we did for what culture. I think the one with me uh, that me and Jr. did the, uh, announcing for. It's the only time I've ever met him in my life. I've heard all these stories. He's, you know, anybody can be the victim of exaggeration or, you know, things can be taken the wrong way, but, have you ever heard of anybody getting in more really strange fucking positions than this guy? At, 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 at some point, yeah, there's there's something wrong here. When he the one got in a fight with his brother in Mexico and they got blood all over the walls of the police station? Yeah, it was in prison, I think, when it happened. No, he was in the police station. It wasn't was in prison. He didn't go to prison. Well, that's right. That's true. You're like Uncle Dave. When somebody goes <laughs> no, 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 no. county jail for it the night, you spent the night in prison. You it was don't a spend the night in fucking prison. It was a jail cell. You do not spend the night in prison. You spend the night in jail. You spend some time in prison. As for, as for you people who have never fucking been in, introduced to the difference. It was a jail cell. I've, I've I've spent a little time boarding with the warden on the bounty of the county, but I've never been to prison. <laughs> anyway, Alberto Del Rio, yes. What the fuck? I don't I don't know what to say about the guy because I don't know him. I've heard that cocaine is heavily involved. You've heard that. I've heard that. <laughs> it's not like anybody couldn't figure that out. But you know, <laughs> what the world could it be? <laughs> fucking hell 
And no wonder the fucking, uh, uh, the Knight family did a number on him. Jesus Christ. That's why, you know, well, when he, uh, when he was attacked by the knife wielding assailant outside of a restaurant in San Antonio, according to the newspaper, sources say that a member of her family was very perplexed at the way he was treating her and came all the way over here to register that perplexedness. Don't my page? Yes. Who else would I be talking about? I said the Knight family. Oh, that's right. You did say the Knight family. Yeah. <laughs> the Knight man. <laughs> and the day man, the day man is, is the nemesis of the night man. But uh, it sounds like the nemesis of fucking Alberto Del Rio is rehab at this point. I don't know. I have no idea what's going on, but it, it, and it's not like this woman just made this shit up. Why would you make up? Not only did he assault me numerous times and cuff me about the head and face, but he said he'd uh, kidnap my son and drop him off where nobody would find him. The fuck? What do you think Uncle Mill Moscaris has to say about all this? I bet you Uncle Mill is rewriting the will as we speak. You think that Mill Moscaris lets anyone in his will? <laughs> he doesn't seem like a very gracious guy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Mill's got a will because I don't think Mill plans to go. I think Mill will be around for a while. <laughs> But no, I, you know, if, if, if Alberto Del Rio has any friends, I suggest that they suggest to him that he maybe ought to calm down doing what he's doing. That's all I have to say about that. Well, Jim, our next question was sent in <laughs> via email. Dead, dead puppies, dead puppies, dead puppies. Don't crack, don't crack, Brian, don't crack. At gmail.com from Blake D. <laughs> <laughs> the people at home have no idea why I'm laughing right now. <laughs> Question for Mr. Cornett. Concerning the genetic jackhammer with balls the size of grapefruits, Vincent Kennedy McMahon. This question is concerning Vince McMahon and his former journey selling bodybuilding supplements. I've heard a rumor for many years, but I've never heard a wrestling talent or someone in the business address this. So my question is, I think he left that and is there. Is there any truth to the rumor that Vince McMahon buried 3 million gallons of unsold IcoPro behind Titan Tower? <laughs> the IcoPro slogan was, you gotta want it. If this is true, then apparently McMahon didn't want it. No, you couldn't. Bear, Titan Tower doesn't like exist on Gilligan's Island where you can just go out in the backyard and dig a fucking hole. It is surrounded by the city of Stamford, Connecticut and concrete and parking lots and buildings. There's no way to go out behind Titan Tower and bury any, especially millions of gallons of whatever. I don't know what kind of containers it came in, but um, no, I... I Honestly, I don't know what they did with it. Um, I, I, I remember hearing they had a bunch left over. That that much is true, but I have no idea what what they did with it or how they disposed of it. I still remember Vince McMahon eating IcoPro. What do they call them? Power bars. The fucking thing. It's 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 supposed to look like a candy bar, but it certainly doesn't taste like it. It's supposed to be healthy and give the bodybuilders protein. All in the nineties, all the guys had these power bars in their fucking bags, and they were eating them all the time, like they actually tasted good. That's what Vince would snack on when we were at his house, and he was and we were writing or whatever, and it, it was either not time to go to the little deli down the road to get the lunch sandwiches or it was mid afternoon. He'd bite into these goddamn Ica pro bars. And I, one time he said, well, here, try it. You know, and I fuck, it was like goddamn a chocolate flavored roofing tile. But I, you know, I don't know what they did with all that stuff. No, but in power bars, that's the thing. Power bar, put penciled behind his ear and a power bar in his fucking mouth. Okay, well... I was eating Reese's Cups. Would he eat a power bar on a, the way to his barber to get his hair no, cut while he, he's shaving his face? He he could he couldn't... That's two things he couldn't do. He couldn't either eat a power bar or fucking uh, get a haircut while he was working at the same time as shaving his face. He couldn't do all those things at the same time. He, he could work and shave his face. 
He could work and eat a power bar. He could even work and get a haircut. But he couldn't do it more than two of those things at the same time. But I'll tell you what, now that I think about it, you know what, if they'd have had this back then, Vince McMahon could have done this, and he could have done at least two or three things at the same time, and that's Manscaped products to shave his sack. Because the the balls the size of grapefruits, well, they have to be contained in something, and fuck, that thing would look like a fucking alpaca sweater if you didn't fucking trim it a little bit. And if Vince McMahon had had the manscaped lawnmower 3.0 available to him then i have no doubt that he would have used it because he fought that war on the the beard on his face i never asked him about this but i'm sure he would fight equally as hard on the war on the the bushiness of his balls because why have wet soggy bushy balls in between your perfectly sculptured legs when he'd do the leg machine at the gym you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but anyway how was that for a transition? Manscaped, folks. You know the whole deal. You can be slicker than come on a gold tooth with their products. And the newest, new and improved product, the Lawnmower 3.0, it's a waterproof cordless body trimmer. It's got a charging station. You can plug it into the wall. You can plug it into your laptop. You can plug it into anything. It has a LED light on it. So you can, if not only can you shave your sensitive parts in the dark but also even if you have light on in the room i have since found since i'm a little stiff and not as flexible as i used to be that i can't get in certain positions to get certain areas and so i just have to kind of you know go by feel well with the lawnmower 3.0 it's completely nick proof so there's no problem there you're not going to fucking could cut an artery but the light can shine on those hairs at such a, 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 a way that you could actually see them standing up and you could watch them get mowed over. This thing's quiet as a mouse. It just purrs, but yet it just, it cuts the hairs just like a goddamn weed whacker would out in your yard. They just fall away. So anyway, my favorite, without doubt, my favorite grooming tool ever built, the Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0. And you... You folks out there, as you know, because they are friends of the program here, you can save money, even more money now than ever before, because for a limited time, you're going to get not one but two free gifts. You're going to get a travel bag for free $39 value. You're going to get the patented high-performance anti-chafing Manscaped boxer briefs. That's when you get the perfect package. For your perfect package, the perfect package includes the lawnmower 3.0, the crop preserver, the anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, and a few other gimmicks as well. You can also get 20% off and free shipping. My God, they're giving away the whole store. So manscaped.com, 20% off, free shipping on what you buy. It's not only 20% off the, the perfect package or the lawnmower, but everything site-wide. And you get the shed travel bag and the Manscaped boxer briefs. I don't know what else we can do for you. Folks, you can make playing with your balls the best part of your day, if it's not already. All you got to do is go to manscaped.com and use the promo code DRIVE. Manscaped.com slash DRIVE and get all that good stuff. Slicker than a fucking bald egg is what your fucking nads will be. The wolf man may have nads, but they don't have hair on them. Nards. Nards. Nads, nards. I thought they were nads. They're nads, not nards. Not in Monster Squad, they're not. Well, we already did a fucking plug based on plays on the word squad and squats. We can't do that anymore, so let's move on. Our next question, Jim, sent in. Is, is your is your sports been locked down? Is your catcher still allowed to squat? I don't even know what we were talking about. Our next question sent in via email, the corny drive through at gmail.com from Jarrett in Atlanta, Georgia. I've never heard you guys talk about Eddie Guerrero much on the podcast, but what is Jim's opinion of him as a talent and an in-ring worker? I know you probably weren't around him too much, but is there any fond memories you have of Eddie Guerrero from any time that you met him? Also, how much longer do you think he would have wrestled? 
Where would he be today? And what was your reaction when you heard the news of his passing? Jesus Christ, this is an essay question. I loved Eddie Guerrero as a as a talent and as a person. I saw him more than I got to work with him. By the time that that they got, uh, you know, he and Benoit, the, the, his group came from WCW. I was already down here in Louisville, but obviously he came to developmental a number of times, worked a couple of OVW events. Uh, he was in the HWA working for Les Thatcher and made some shows down here when he had had his issues and was, you know, was trying to get back in the swing of things and get back in ring shape. But no, Eddie was, he was one of the best workers in the business because he understood it and he got it. And he got it from a mental standpoint as well as a physical standpoint. Part of the reason why he got it so well is because his whole, he came from, a wrestling family. His father, Gory, was a huge star in Mexico. And the Guerrero family in El Paso, actually, I don't, I may have met Eddie when he was like fucking 10. I don't know, because we did actually work a show in El Paso that was promoted by Gory Guerrero uh, back in the world class days. And it was a great town. And boy, those people, they were so wild in El Paso that the previous match before ours, they had to take an unscheduled intermission to warn the people to calm down before we went out. I'm like, oh, fuck, that's great. You're already having to warn the people to calm down. Here comes the Midnight Express. We're all going to be fucking knifed. But anyway, great house, great wrestling family. They were over like fucking God. Eddie was the youngest. And he, he was kind of, it was kind of like a Mexican Armstrong family. Um, I, even though I never got to see Gory Guerrero wrestle, from what I was told, the different sons got different aspects of his, his, uh, you know, his personality and his work and et cetera, where, you know, whereas one got the, I, I think they said Chavo was probably the best fired up, you know, fucking promo had the fire of the Gory Guerrero, but you know. Uh, Mondo got something else, but Eddie just got the mind for it, I think, as well as he had the the whole package physically. Even though he was the smallest one, he really wasn't the... He was shorter than Hector. Hector was uh, worked for me in Smoky Mountain. I'd known Hector since back in 1979 when he came through Memphis. He was taller, but he was thinner. Eddie was shorter, but he had, you know, he had the body uh, in his WWF years. However, he got there. So anyway, as a performer and as a person, he was great. When he was in developmental, he's always wanting to help the guys. He was humble. He didn't have any fucking, you know, attitude problems. His The only problem he had was just the the chemical issues that he had and that he had whipped and didn't relapse. He He had a heart attack, but it was from damage that had been previously done. That was the heartbreaking thing about the whole deal was that it wasn't he had done things he shouldn't have done but he had gotten by that and gotten over it and and was moving on and had got back to the top of the fucking business and wasn't doing things that he shouldn't do anymore and so especially the timing was horrible i mean you know there's no good timing but that timing was really bad and and heartbreaking but i you know i can't say anything but he never worked with the invisible man at least as far as i know so I can't say anything bad about Eddie as a person or a professional. He was tremendous. And I mean, just the little things that he could do in, in not only in the matches, but just in, in his promos. And he took some of the shit that they gave him that would have killed anybody else. And he made it work because he had that drive and determination to. So I don't remember what other parts of that 18 part question I haven't addressed yet. Did you meet him when he came to center stage in 89? He had that memorable match with Terry Funk. Well, people- you know what? We just, we asked that, uh, not long ago, or we talked about that. And I don't think we were there then. I think that's when the midnight may have been off, but I do remember, uh, as I had said then, I remember Bobby talking about him when he came back a few years later and had another match. I remember Bobby talking about him, say, hey, I've seen the youngest Guerrero. Boy, he's good. So um, did we ever determine when, what date that match was with Terry Funk? I want to say it was June of 89, but I can go back so, and double check. That may, I, we didn't get back till the June clash. So point is, we may have been two ships passing in the night. But 
But no, you know, every once in a while when Bobby would say to me, you know, yes, so-and-so's good, you know, that would be enough for me. But when I first saw him, I think I saw the match on television with Terry. <laughs> but I knew they weren't going to give Eddie a job then because he was like 160 pounds then. And it was just, it was too far out. Uh, it, you know, it, it they wouldn't have been able, they wouldn't have known what to do with him. It wouldn't have been good for Eddie. It wouldn't have been good for anybody if they'd have brought him in then because he'd have been a 160 pound guy that could outwork all the fucking, the rest of the roster, but still trying to have matches and nobody would have bought it and they wouldn't have got it. He needed to get a little bit older, get a little bit rougher and a little bit bigger. And then it worked. It aired May 20th, 1989. Yeah, that was while we were gone. All right, well, our next question, Jim, sent in via Twitter using the hashtag Quinny Drive Through from Grant Cameron. What are your opinions regarding this? From, from New Zealand? Uh, it does not specify here. <laughs> but what are your opinions regarding this? And what he sent is a link to a TMZ article. Nikki Bella says Ronda's WWE debut was a slap in the face to female wrestlers. I've heard about this controversy. Oh, God. I, please tell me more of what Mildred Burke had to say. Nikki, <laughs> Nikki Bella says she was pissed WWE decided to introduce Ronda Rousey on the night of a historic all-women's event, calling the move, quote, a bit of a slap in the face to the female wrestlers that came before her. Oh, my God. Of course, WWE hosted its inaugural Ladies Only Royal Rumble in January 2018 with 30 wrestlers, including Nikki, duking it out for an hour straight. After the Rumble, Rowdy Ronda Rousey came out of the tunnel for the first time ever and pointed to a WrestleMania sign hanging in the rafters. The moment was supposed to tease Ronda's wrestling debut, which went down at Mania in April 2018. But Nikki felt the move essentially stole the thunder from the history-making rumble. While Bella says she has no beef with Ronda, she explained her frustrations in the Bella Twins' new book, Incomparable. Quote, it was nothing against Ronda. It is thrilling that she is at WWE. But it was such a bit of a slap in the face to all the historic women wrestlers who had come out for the match. The main event, only to have that moment upstaged by the Ronda announcement. Nikki says she planned to retire after the historic event due to a neck injury, and it sucked to have her grand finale overshadowed by a UFC superstar. Quote, it just didn't need to happen like that, Nikki says in her book. Oh, good God. And then uh, she ended up, says here, canceling her plans after the Rumble and went on to retire later that year after losing to Rousey in a championship match for the women's belt. And she said that her last match was epic and career-justifying. And that <sighs> night was worth breaking my neck for. But what do you think about the idea that Nikki oh, good Bella... Lord. No, okay, for, for one thing, if it was Beth Phoenix or Natty Neidhart or Sarah Del Rey, who never even got to wrestle for them, they hired her as a trainer because she was such a good worker. They hired her to train the other women, but she can't wrestle for them. Or somebody else that may hold some water, but Nikki fucking Bella. Let's be the Bella twins. Let's be honest. They were two at attractive twins that got signed because they were attractive, taught to fucking wrestle, paid to go to school to wrestle, wrestled for a few years for the biggest company in the world where they were protected and put over a variety of fucking actual legitimate women wrestlers who wanted to be wrestlers on their own and got good enough to then go and get signed by the WWE. And now they're famous for taking semi-naked pictures of themselves when they're pregnant, which is, I'm sorry, just a horrible visual that I don't need to be subjected to. Any pregnancies, whether you're male or female or whatever, you're pregnant, cover that shit up. It looks painful, and I don't fucking like it. But that's why we're not talking about Mildred Burke here. And I fucking got on Ronda Rousey because she then turned around and said, yeah, well, I like playing with my friends, but uh, he's fucking fans, a bunch of fake fights, blah, blah, blah. She's a fucking idiot, apparently. And then people said she was working. Well, once she said fake fights, no, she ain't working no more. Now she's just a piece of shit. She can say all she wants to about the other girls. Don't say fake fights. Um, incomparable. I just looked this up in the dictionary. Being such that comparison is impossible. Beyond comparison. 
You're standing next to somebody that's identical to you in every way. The one fucking word that a twin's book should not be titled is incomparable. Nevertheless, somebody else should have made those statements. And no, it, it wasn't stealing thunder from fucking the women's movement. I, I want to have a movement every time I hear about the women's movement in wrestling. It was building up a fucking major star from another sport to come in and fucking challenge the top girl at WrestleMania to do business. It's the same thing as when you introduce any other fucking guy as a surprise after the main event title match is over with. Oh my God, look, it's here. He's so-and-so. He's here. He'll be the next challenger. That's fucking wrestling. I wouldn't expect either of the Bella Twins to know this because since they've never been in the fucking wrestling business, they've only been in the WWE business, you would think one of them's married to Daniel Bryan. He could smarten her up. And you know who their mom married, right? Oh, I heard that her mo that their mother, the Bella Twins' mother, married Johnny Ace. That's right. What the fuck? Jesus Christ. Anyway, yeah. It, it, it'd be great... That sentiment would be great, even though misplaced in that instance. But I could understand David Schultz was not happy about Mr. T being brought in, being the main event at WrestleMania, taking a spot away from a wrestler. Ronda Rousey was different, as we've talked about. She could handle it. She was, it wasn't Mr. T, a complete bullshit celebrity who couldn't fight at all, being put in a main event over one of the boys. It was somebody who actually could fucking fight from another sport. I put Rousey in the same category with Tyson, not in the same category as Jay Leno in a wrestling match. Um, and to build fucking uh, uh, business for the future. What she said afterwards when she's, now she's on her farm with her goats or whatever, and she doesn't want to come back to wrestling, so she calls it fake fights. That's something they should have got hot about. But once again, the Bellas would be the last ones to get hot about that because when you think of great female wrestlers through the years, how long would you have to be thinking before you thought of the Bellas? A while. You know, she, It makes me... Well, go ahead, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say, I would imagine after she broke her neck, she must have been very sore. Well, you know, I was about to say, it really gives me a pain in my ass. I was going for the other direction. You've got pain in the neck. I'm going for a pain in the ass. If you've got pains, wherever they may be, from your nose to your toes, then all you have to do is hop on the Omax bandwagon. Because we've talked about the Omax Cryo Freeze roll-on pain reliever, the sport cream. It rejuvenates you. It makes your joints and your bones feel better, aches and pains, etc. They've got something new. CryoFreeze Advanced Joint Defense. It's a one-a-day supplement with hemp-derived CBD, no THC, whether good or bad for you folks out there, but also a clinically proven ingredient called NEM that relieves joint discomfort and soreness in seven days or left, you, less. You take one of these, and in seven days or less, you're feeling better, no aches and pains, sore muscles, joint overuse, the aging. If you want to stay active, folks, if you want to run with the big dogs, you got to get up off the porch. And the best way to get off the porch is with Omax. So improve your flexibility, your long-term joint health, and so much more, and save money for a limited time only. 20% off their introductory pricing on the Omax cryo-freeze supplements like the advanced joint defense plus free shipping or 20 percent off any product site-wide through the end of the month just go to omaxhealth.com o-m-a-x health.com and enter the code drive and get 20 percent off advanced joint defense site-wide and free shipping i don't know how you can do any better than this you will be Fit as a fiddle and ready to strum with CryoFreeze Advanced Joint Defense. Don't let muscle soreness continue to be an excuse for not living an active lifestyle. Do what I do. Turn cartwheels out in the front yard every day. After you take one of the, it's better than meth, folks. And see, that is actually, that is a, a point that I can make when selling our sponsors' products that is completely incontradictory. You cannot prove me wrong on that when I say that taking this stuff is better than meth. 
Because almost anything's better than meth, right? I'm going to stay out of this one. All right. Well, there you go. Well, you you ought to know. Well, I'm trying to figure out how our sponsor's going to react. A couple of weeks ago, you compared the cereal to cocaine. Now no, I didn't. Now you're, no, you said there was cocaine in the cereal. No, I said it would be like the South Park episode where they put the cocaine on top of the marijuana. See, I was comparing it to something somebody else had done. It was Christmas snow marijuana on that South Park episode from Tegrity Farms. But, hey, there's no THC in this stuff or meth. But it still makes you feel good and makes you get up and go and be active. So try on Max today. How do you think... How do you think I get that two, 300 pounds of packages into the post office all by myself first thing in the morning every day? If I was sore, I couldn't do that. But I take a little bit of this, boom, I'm right out there, pain-free, moving around, moving and grooving, loose as a goose. Okay, well, it's Omax. And let's get a couple more questions in here before we play some songs and get out of here. Jim, in the last week, a ton of questions have come in asking about any stories you would have or any involvement you may have had in the past with Herb Abrams. Anything? Did you ever <laughs> meet him? No, I never met him, never saw him in person. I, I was like everybody else. I was hearing these stories from afar. And yeah, it, yeah, I, he came along, what was it? Was it about a year before or about a year after that idiot in Chicago? With no, the AWF. No, no, he was well before that. Was Herb he Abrams before came that? around in 1990. Paul Alperstein came around, I want to say, either late 94 or early 95. Okay, well, well, that guy, for the fo folks who don't know, that guy started a promotion where he decided he was going to look major league, he was going to tape his television, and he was going to have a big crowd because he was going to pay the fans to come in and be his audience for his television taping. So he paid a thousand people 50 bucks a piece. And to this day, it is the largest negative house ever in wrestling. Now, people in these big companies, they've lost more money on a show, but not on actually just a gate. It was negative $50,000. We paid the fans 50 grand to be there. And I mean, you know, it, I, I could tell uh, every, the guys get in these things hoping, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm sure he was you know, very charming and personable, and he convinced these people he was going to do these things. But it, uh, I, I don't know why they always believe it. The guys do. It's wishful thinking, as Joe Koff used to say, smoking the hopium. But it's right there in front of you. This idiot is not going to do this. He's not going to fucking kick Vince McMahon's ass. I would have thought it would have been a fucking red flag when he you know, announced his booker who was in prison and his top star who was dead. But nobody lets that get in the way of they think, oh, this is going to be great. And then, but I mean, he did have the most spectacular flame out ever in history. And that's the best line that Brian Blair has ever uttered on television in his wrestling career was on Dark Side of the Ring when he said, say what you want about Herb Abrams, but he died doing what he loved, cocaine and hookers. That's pretty much all you can say. No, I, I mean, I knew from the start of it. I, I, every once in a while, I will get flummoxed or fooled by one of these people for a little while, but I, I knew as soon as I heard about it, this was going to be an abortion, Herb Abrams. I knew the AWF thing. I knew that, remember the thing they did at the Cow Palace, supposed to be the world's biggest wrestling and MMA convention at the Cow Palace in San Francisco about 10 years ago? Yeah, that's still one of the best. Yeah, yeah, and well, that's what me and the Midnight Express, we had just been doing reunions at that point, and the guy had contacted me. I didn't know what his name, or I didn't know him. I, he left his name, but I didn't know him, and I wasn't going to go to San Francisco, so I didn't get back with him. But Dennis Condry called me and said, hey, they want us in San Francisco really bad. I said, well, good luck. Get your money up front. And they were going to go, and then I think they thought better of it at the last minute or whatever, but, you know, no, these things are not just going to pop up and happen. That's why, and, and it's almost detrimental when people hear about it. The first thing that a lot of these companies want to do is big publicity about, yeah, we're going to start up and we're going to do this and that. That's why Smoky Mountain Wrestling was a surprise to everybody until it actually showed up on television practically. That's why nobody knew anything about the Sinclair 
deal to buy Ring of Honor until it was announced. Because so many times, so many goofs in this business have come along with too much money and not enough sense and announced they were going to start the biggest wrestling promotion of all time. And then they started out and it fucking sucks, which is what mostly happens. So, uh, you know, I don't think you should build up a lot of false hope. Try to sneak in under the radar and deliver a nice product. Our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Donnie Marco in Tamaquah, Pennsylvania. I recently what, heard... what are all of those names is is uh, is assumed. I recently heard that Roddy Piper was supposed to return to the NWA in 1989 and do a program with Ric Flair. <laughs> Piper instead wound up signing a contract with WWF and working with them. My question is, does this mean Terry Funk was a replacement for Roddy Piper in the summer of 1989 feud? Have you ever heard the story that Roddy Piper was supposed to come to WCW in 1989? I had heard that Piper had talked to Jim Hurd. He was thinking <laughs> about coming back, and he ended up going back to the WWF partly because Jim Hurd, and I think it happened... Part, partly because he talked to Jim Hurd. It happened to Randy Savage, too, I believe. Where, okay, you guys are trying to do something serious, turn to broadcasting, what's the offer? And the offer came in, and it was uh, insulting, and they went with the other option, which was the devil they knew, Vince McMahon. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a long way from supposed to have come in and done this long program or whatever. Most of the time in those days, obviously, people whose contract was coming up would send out a feeler or make a phone call or whatever, just see what the fuck. But it never went, there were no plans ever made that I was aware of for anything that Roddy Piper would have done because it never got that far because Heard kept insulting all of the top stars that would call him with goofy offers. And then finally, that was, that was the fall of 89 was when he rescinded the, the deal that Tully and Arn, he had made for Tully and Arn. And then, we never got anybody unless it was like Jake or whoever was out with Vince because they were in rehab or whatever. Um, but no, that was, it never got to a serious point that they would have discussed all this. I'm sure flair would have loved it. And he probably, he would have done a, a big program with Piper cause they were great friends. It, it would not have been the same shit that he did with funk. It would have been shit you'd do with Piper, but, but that was never going to fucking happen. Do you remember when Savage had talks with Hurd? Uh, truthfully, no, because I, I talked to Jim Hurd as little as possible, and it wasn't like he was going to fucking, you know, call me up on the phone. Hey, I just talked to Savage. I I don't even remember what time frame it was. I remember, you know, somebody said, oh, they talked. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yet, I was, from the first time that I spoke to Jim Hurd, I was convinced that anybody important in the wrestling business that spoke to him one time would never come to work there. And that's I'm trying, I'm trying to think of anyone. What, yeah, I'm trying to think of any names. Can you think of anybody unless Vince had fired them and was not going to bring them back, Jake? Um But even that was that, after Heard. And well, as as a matter of fact, that's right. That was even after Heard. Uh yeah, nobody. Nobody. They didn't get anybody because they gave a few ridiculous money offers and then fucked Tully and Arn in the fall of eighty nine. And that went around the wrestling world. And then it was either they're not offering any money. They're not serious. The guy running the company's a goof. He goes back on his word. You can't trust it. And by the time that 1990 got underway, then the guys working for Vince are looking at the houses that WCW's drawing and go, oh, fuck, that's the last thing we want to do is go there unless they give us a shit ton of money guaranteed, which is what ended up happening. That's finally the way that they got top talent was to give them a shit ton of money guaranteed because anybody that was worth that much money in the wrestling business knew that WCW was not going to fucking draw because of who, not because of who was on the talent roster, but because of who was running the fucking thing. That's why they didn't go unless they got guaranteed money. And then finally Bischoff talked them into fucking spending guaranteed money to get enough names where they could do a fucking phony invasion without Vince's cooperation 
And that ran until they couldn't figure out how to fucking keep it going. But nobody ever wanted to go work there on purpose because it was a great company to work for in the 90s, WCW. Our final question this week, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Nick Rico. When you were managing Yokozuna, were you involved with the backstage crew Yoko and The Undertaker were members of? And do you have any interesting stories involving the BSK crew? Well, no, I, I wasn't a part of that because that was mostly, especially house shows and guys when they were traveling on the road, they, you know, they'd dress in the same area in the locker room, hang out with each other, you know, possibly ride in the same car or a couple of cars, uh, whatever, go out and go to the bar afterwards. You know, so it wasn't like that they had their own fucking locker room at television and they were all to, you know, everybody was still going to do a TV show. So, no, I, I wasn't a member of that group because I was not on the road for house shows. It was only television. I was a member of the office. So even though they knew I wasn't going to stooge on them because I'd roll my eyes at the fucking office right along with them, uh, you know, I wasn't going to go s sit in on their goddamn private conversations. I'm definitely not going to the fucking bar with the boys afterwards because not only did they not kayfabe even in those days, but also I didn't want any more lawsuits than I already had. And, you know, so I was not a, a part of that group, but it, w it wasn't like a click thing where they went ridiculous with it. They actually came up with it as an anti-click because it was the idea of this boys club in a treehouse was so ridiculous anyway. They decided to kind of spoof it. But no, I was I was not a member of any cliques, of foreign or domestic. I just got in, tried to fucking talk to the guys that entertained me, and got out as quickly as possible of WWF TV tapings. The best stretch ever was when Dick Murdoch was there. They brought Dickie in to do something. I don't know what Manage it was. Manage Backlund. Manage Backlund. That's right. And, and then they changed their mind on that. And just for the next like two or three months, they just brought Dickie to all the TVs. He didn't do anything, but he came to all the TVs <clears throat> and they paid him. I, and, and he would sit to me. I'd say, Dick, what are you doing? He said, I don't know. I'm just getting a check. He said, I don't care. He said, I'll come up and tell stories all they want me to. And I guess they were afraid to tell him for a while he was done. <laughs> but, but those were the most entertaining televisions whenever Dick Murdoch or Dutch Mantell was around. Then I could stand the TVs. Other times, sometimes it was a fucking chore. Okay, and with that, the drive through. Speaking of chores. Close. Speaking of chores. Now, next week, can I watch something from like 1952 so I can be entertained instead of pissed off? You can watch whatever you want. You say that now on the air in front of people. Well, we'll see what and transpires during the week. Yeah. Well, I got to I got to watch the Undertaker thing, but that'll be fun. But we we need to we need to do some reviews of some shows from back when people actually had a clue of how to present wrestling cuz this this fucking cinematic bullshit ain't going to do any of us any good. Which did you enjoy more, the Money in the Bank and Titan Tower or the AEW Street Fight in the Corridor of the Football Stadium? Well, the the Street Fight honestly was better than this. Because at least there was a couple of things that if you didn't mind the fact that it's a brand new company and they're doing this shit already and how they're going to top it and everything still has to be silly, there was a couple of entertaining moments, but this was just goofy in concept and execution. And guys, you know, we're taking chances on getting legitimately hurt for no fucking reason. So yeah, I think the street fight was better. With that, we wrap up another episode of Jim Cornette's drive Through. Are we wrapping this up, or are we just tossing it out as is? Oh, you know, it's late in the day. I think maybe we're just tossing it out. But, of course, as we tell you each and every week, you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast. 605pod.com are available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. Don't forget patreon.com slash cornet get access to the archives of the experience and the drive through a new batch of shows goes up each and every week this week's shows contain an interview that everyone should check out if you like wrestling history with larry Matisic. some really cool stuff there patreon.com slash cornet 
Don't forget about the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. We have full episodes, clips of episodes, and of course, the Omnibus Collections, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Cornette's Collectibles, we're not doing this, right? <laughs> Well, folks, uh, all the domestic orders from the last several weeks are going out this week. The internationals are going out next week. The store is closed now, but it reopens on Monday, May the 18th, for your shopping pleasure. Don't forget the drive-thru is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. And don't forget to shave your balls. But until Friday on The Experience and next week here on The Drive-Thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Is it Nads or Nards?